Welcome to the public meeting of uh, Kettering General Hospital, which is on Zoom uh, because of all the COVID restrictions. You're all very welcome. So as ever, we're going to uh, start off with uh, a patient story today. And uh, in order to do that, we're welcoming Joe Dilley, who's deputising for Leanne Hatchell, who's on leave, and uh, James Allen, who's our patient experience lead, who will present the slides and the video. We always start with a patient story. Just for the benefit of the public, you should be able to see our names below us on the screen, and you should always be able to see who's speaking. Um, so that should help you to understand what's going on. Um, on you go, Joe, please. <laughs> I think James, that you actually have the video. Yes, we're, um, Richard's going to play that for us. So this is more of a, a family story rather than a patient in particular, and uh, it's come from a lady called Zena, and it's about her mother who was admitted into the hospital um, back in June as her Parkinson's deteriorated. Uh, mixed emotions from the family and reservations in terms of the current situation and the fact that they were unable to come and see her while she was in hospital. However, they made use of our virtual visiting service and uh, it worked wonders for them as a family. It really supported the family to connect with the patient. And you'll hear through the video, um, a member of staff by the name of Sophie being mentioned, um, who was instrumental to connecting uh, the family and the patient and, and making sure that they were able to speak and, um, uh, and share some time together. So I'd like uh, to play the video now and then I'll cover a, a bit more information afterwards if that's okay. Richard, are you going to play the video? Guys, are we going to play this video or are we just going to move on and come back to it later? Let me try once more. Apologies for that one second. Whilst we're waiting for the video to load, I'll cover some of the statistics for you. So um, at the moment, there are um, 27 wards with 54 devices covering the hospital. Uh, the average runtime is um, 53 minutes per visit is is what we're averaging at every visit is lasting around about that time in total um one of the things that is mentioned within the video is about the patient's dexterity and being able to hold the ipad or or not being able to hold the ipad and that's where sophie's role again played a huge part in being able to hold it and also um if the patient was hard of hearing relay the message on and speak up for them so uh what we've done is we're working with our charitable funds committee to look at and trial some uh, iPad stands, floor stands that are able to wield around the ward. So we're looking to uh, get eight to start off with and see how well they work and use them in those areas where uh, patients have been identified that it's harder for them to hold. So they're going to be rolled out to Naseby A and B, Lamport, Twywell, Pretty A and B, and in ICU as well. Um, so I'll be keeping uh, board informed of the outcome of that. We're hoping that they should be here within the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, but now that the video is up and running, I'll, uh, I'll let Richard press play. My name is Zena Toseland and um, my mum, Sylvia Beattie, um, used the duo. A uh, bit of background on mum. She was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2012. And those of you that know anything about Parkinson's or know it's a progressive illness. And by July of this year, she had deteriorated an awful lot. Um, her Parkinson's had made it almost impossible for her to eat or drink anything that would sustain her um, in any sufficient amount. So she was in a lot of trouble. Um, so we had to call an ambulance. And due to COVID, we were not allowed to accompany her in the ambulance. And we were told that we would not be allowed to visit her either. 
Now, mum also had some dementia and we knew that she would be very confused, that she would feel completely abandoned. And we were really, really anxious and concerned about what we could do, how we could see her. Um, and we felt really completely powerless, completely helpless. We knew mum had real poor dexterity. And although she had a mobile phone, we knew that she wouldn't be able to use that unaided. And so we were just really concerned about having any contact. And we thought basically we were going to have to rely on ringing the ward and hoping that someone at the desk would know enough to be able to give us some information about how she was progressing and so on. But then we were introduced to Google Duo, the virtual visits, and we could book slots. We could book slots every day and we'd be able to see mum and her. Um, there were some initial issues with this because at first it was relying on nurses to sort of administer it for us. And this was completely unrealistic from, from their point of view. Their workload is really heavy. And to be able to commit to a time that we booked was just impossible for them. Um, but with a couple of days, we were introduced to Sophie Cunningham. She's a therapeutic um, activities coordinator. And for us, that was a complete game changer. Once she was on board, this was just uh, fantastic, so easy. Sophie became a regular point of contact, a familiar face for mum. She would see mum every day. She would work with mum anyway. And when we did the virtual um, visits with her, Sophie could be there. She could hold a tablet for mum. She could interpret mum's responses for us because mum would sometimes with their Parkinson's speak really, really quietly. So you couldn't actually hear what she was saying. And also sometimes mum's well, she was incoherent. So Sophie would sort of translate for us. And also she would repeat our questions for mum or repeat our statements to mum. And so it meant that our conversations could actually continue and work properly. We could have proper conversations. It also meant that with Sophie being there, our virtual calls were never missed. They were always on time. We never had to be concerned that, you know, someone wouldn't be able to get to the iPad or know where it was or know how to set it up. She knew all of this and made it just so simple. She wasn't only supporting mum, she was really supporting us as well because we were, feel, as I said, we were feeling powerless. We were feeling helpless, um, not being able to get to mum in any way. So Sophie being there and doing these virtual visits every day completely um, put our minds at rest and helped us. Uh, Sophie had sort of put such a, a positive attitude to what she was doing and she was willing to answer any of our questions. If she didn't know the answers, she would find out. Um, and her support for us was like unrelenting. Nothing was ever too much, too much trouble. Um, the daily duo meant daily Sophie <laughs> and it meant regular, a regular person, a familiar face for mum and for us. And we had this kind of little loop with this little family that we had now made between mum and Sophie and, and ourselves. Um, and that regular contact through the virtual was just invaluable for us. We developed a really good relationship with Sophie. <clears throat> um, our sessions on Duo were always really positive. We came away from them feeling buoyed up, feeling positive, feeling happy. Um, and we always had really, really good experiences with it. Um, they were fantastic ideas. So well done to your colleague, Anna, for thinking them up. Brilliant. Um, but as I said earlier, it can't be the job of the nurses. It's unrealistic to expect them to find that sort of time as much as they'd love to. I mean, they would adore the opportunity to sit with the patient and talk to the relatives every day. But with the staffing ratios as they are, that's just not feasible for them. Um, and it's unrealistic to expect them to be able to do this. And if you do that, you will create problems with this. It worked for us because we had Sophie to help us. Um, it wouldn't have worked because mum wasn't capable of doing it herself. You're going to have patients that are capable, that have the dexterity, that have the knowledge. It's a different story for them. They would be able to work this no problem and they wouldn't need the intervention of the nurses. 
but for someone in mum's position, the old, those that are disabled, those that just don't know how to use modern technology, will need that support person, the Sophies of this world. Um, because she could sit and talk to mum. She worked with mum, so she knew mum, and that really helped us. And then it took away the pressure as well for us. Um, so Sophie was amazing. Even if she was under pressure, she didn't show it. And that duo system made what was a difficult situation, not only manageable for us, but a pleasure for us. Um, and that's something I wasn't expecting when mum went into hospital in July. I thought this is going to be a complete and utter nightmare. But it is a fantastic idea. So again, well done, Anna. Well done for thinking of it because it really, really did support and help us a great deal during that time. And just to bring you up to date on mum, she did come out of hospital in early August for end of life care at home. And she passed away peacefully on the 4th of September. But the hospital, again, were amazing for us. They organised carers for us, uh, hospice at home, Marie Curie, um, district nurses. We had as much support as you could want when we were looking after them at the end. So our memories of the hospital, because of the duo, are positive and good memories. Um, Mum was showing a lot of care, a lot of kindness, respect, um, dignity, all the things you would want for yourself and all the things you'd want for your loved ones. So thank you very much. Thanks for sharing that, Richard. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, James, do you have anything you want to add on the end of that? Um, uh, I know that to Sophie's role in the wider organization has been discussed and it's something that Leanne and, and Joe have, have discussed and how we can support that role into other areas of the hospital. And there are some wards at the moment that have it. So we have um, two therapeutic activity coordinators on NASB A and B. We have one for pretties. I think there is also um, another role within surgery somewhere, one of the surgical wards. Um, but it is something that Leanne has recognised and actually it's something that we're looking to introduce in other areas of the hospital uh, because of the benefit of it. And one thing I didn't mention at the beginning was actually the number of visits that have taken place. And to date, uh, there are in excess of 1400 visits with an average time of 53 minutes, which I think is um, really, really positive. And we started off with a system called Google Duo. We rolled it out fairly quickly. And then Anna and the team came in and introduced virtual visiting. So. Um, the family experienced both systems. Um, very positive, so thank you for your time. Thank you very much, James. That was very well presented. Does anybody have any comments about what is a just a remarkably good story in very difficult times? And um, we know how difficult it is with people not being able to visit. Andy. Hi, uh, thanks, Alan. Yeah, I just would like, like to add that um, this is a good example of where actually there's been collaboration across the NHS. So we've worked with a couple of London hospitals um, and we developed this, in, the, the virtual visiting in tandem with them. Uh, this is now available as an open source for the rest of the NHS to use. And ourselves and the London Hospital are HSJ award finalists for, the, for this work. So just thought I'd mention those. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is about patient experience and the feedback that we get from, the, from those calls is absolutely fantastic. So it's a really good, uh, good news story. It is. And, um, yeah, it's good to see that the hospital can respond as efficiently and effectively. And, um, you know, it's always good to see us on things like HSG Award finalists. These are important things in recruitment and retention, everything else. Andrew. Um, thank you, Alan. Firstly, I'd like to extend my uh, condolences uh, to Mrs. Beattie's family. Um, but at the same time, it was an incredibly uh, empowering, empathic story. Um, we had a session earlier this month on learning from excellence. And this person's entire thesis in learning from excellence is we never focus on what we do well. We often focus on what we don't do well. We focus on the negative and try to learn from that. And this is a wonderful example of what does get done extremely well within the organization. And 
you know, we, we do this consistently and we do this well. So it's, lo it's, it's lovely to actually see it showcased at board. And I have a real feel good factor after hearing that story. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's been very, uh, you know, uh, endearing. Um, Parkinson's disease is a neurological degenerative disease that affects movement disorder characterized by rigidity, lack of movement, uh, you know, a, a tremor associated with that. People become expressionless, as, as we heard, for, as, as we heard for, from the speaker, you know, their, their voice becomes very, very quiet. They often get neurological uh, 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 and, and, and psychological conditions associated with this. So nursing patients like this is incredibly difficult. And it was just really heartwarming to hear how wonderful everyone responded to that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, it is a good story, and you, we should um, know about good stories as well as not so good stories. So that's an excellent bit. Lisa? I wondered whether we thought about using it in cases where we've got a language barrier. Absolutely, where... we do. Um, uh, every one of the iPads that's currently on the ward has an app there that staff can book uh, interpreters. Um, so we can have BSL interpreters or we can have um, video interpreters if we can't get them in face to face. So, yes. Simon, just checking um, before I go any further, you can see hands up or not because my I hand. I, I, you mean actual virtual hands up or? Yes, virtual hands up. Just so before. Uh, I haven't you. got virtual hands up to the best of my knowledge, so. Okay. I will um, check in a minute, but I don't think I do. Um, so uh, I, I mean, uh, to, to build on the comments that others have made, um, first I'd like to congratulate um, Sophie um, because clearly the role she played. Um, in caring um, was central to the family's experience of the last days of um, her life, uh, Sylvia's life. And, and I think it's a, um, it, it goes to show um, how, although the technology, the skill that we apply is absolutely the heart of what we do, also the human beings um, and the care with which the human beings discharge their tasks really does make a difference. So. A big well done, I'm sure, from all of us to Sophie for what she did. It was amazing. Um, uh, and I think we need to think about how we roll this out, James. So I guess, James and Joe, I'd be interested in your reflections on where we can go with this, because um, this is something, you know, we should not forget. We've got, I think, um, 80 or 90 patients with COVID in the hospital today. Um, and... Um, this is something we're going to be living with for a while. So I just wondered um, what support you might need in, in terms of rolling this out further and continuing um, to uh, develop the service that we've offered. And I should have said well done to you, Anna, of course. I didn't, um, um, and welcome. Nice to have you along with us today. Maybe you'd like to comment too. Okay, thanks for that. I, I have got hands up now. Uh, so Jo has hers up when I guess that's the start of the response to a question. Yeah. So Jo. Thank, uh, thank you, Ellen. Um, absolutely, I would um, echo what Simon has said. Um, a big thank you to Zena for sharing her story, which has a sad outcome for her, but really demonstrates how much communication can impact on an experience and positive communication, regardless of the outcome. Um, absolutely, we need to replicate Sophie. Um, she's done an amazing job and we will make sure that she is recognised for the work that she's done. And it really does highlight how a role that is not high in banding, not high in salary, um, doesn't require an awful lot of training, can really be therapeutic to patients and their families. Um, we do have activity coordinators in other wards, as James has said, mostly within medicine. Um, I think what uh, I'm particularly keen on is rolling that uh, roll out to Barnwell B and Barnwell C, which are our trauma wards, which um, also take several, uh, well, many uh, elderly patients who frequently have comorbidities, but also have a broken bone as well and uh, may require quite extended lengths of stay. So I think uh, that would be really useful on Barnwell B and Barnwell C. Um, I've already been pushing that with our divisional head of nursing and the matron there, and they're very keen. So uh, we'll be looking 
specifically there to roll this out to. But we'll make sure we speak to Sophie as well, who's done a marvellous job. OK, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else's hands. I think everything. Oh, yes. Anna. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, it's just showing the impact of the family centred approach and how um, this has a massive impact on patients' emotions and their well-being. And it's been a very interesting um, rollout because when we realised the, the impact of this, we actually um, sped up the rollout across the organisation. So what we should have done within, let's say, three months, we did it within weeks um, of rollout. And I think right now where we are within the organisation is how we can increase the number of um, actual devices that um, we have across the organization because I think one of the things I will be mentioning later on will be about Christmas and ensuring that there's a virtual Christmas table so everybody within our organization that does not have that um, device um, um, on their personal being they're able to you know be granted that seat on a virtual Christmas table so that's one of the you know initiatives that we're looking at with virtual visits um, and we've been a, we started rolling that out already. So it's how, how can we ensure that everyone within the organization um, and within our beds numbers have that um, care given and that emotional kind of hand holding, you know, on the Christmas, around the Christmas table. So I think from, from our perspective, I think it would be very good to have a bit more devices so that we can actually uh, get everybody in, in um, for Christmas. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. I think we're um, there. It's good stuff. James, Joe, Anna, good stuff. And thank you very much for all you've done in that. And Sophie, I know Sophie can't hear us, but anyway, it's really good stuff, Sophie. So thank you very much everybody for that. Um, so moving on now to the opening administration for the meeting. Um, uh, welcome, apologies. Any apologies for absence, Richard? As you mentioned, Alan, um, Leanne, apologies, um, the Director of Nursing and Quality, and Joe Dilley, who's the Deputy, is um, substituting. Thank you. Thank you. For any of the members of the public, if you are, you're very welcome watching this. If you have specifically come in to watch the um, hospital redevelopment uh, item, it's scheduled for 12.45, and we're usually pretty good at staying to time. So 12.45-ish, if that is your particular interest, but you're very welcome to stay for all of it. We're also welcoming today um, two colleagues from uh, the University of Leicester, Professor Kevin Harris and Professor Philip Baker. Um, Professor Harris was with us in the NGH board um, last week and um, Professor Baker is, is, is head of school. So um, this is all part of our uh, building relationship and our aspiration to be a university hospital. And we're grateful for them coming along today. And we also welcome Joe Woods, our CQC link inspector, who is, um, is on the call as well. So, minutes in the previous meeting on the 30th of September, are you happy to have a fair record? That would be a yes, thank you. Um, the action report, all actions are completed. So I um, assume there's nothing anybody wants to pick up from that. No, good, thank you very much. I don't have very much to say on, on this occasion. Um, uh, on the ICS, we have uh, integrated care system. We, um, we have a paper on the board today about that. Um, and, I circ and I think you will all have had copies or the link at least to the NHS England, NHS improvement document on the future of relationships as ICS is moved to, or the intention of ICS is to move to statutory basis and the requirement for provider trust to form collaboratives. And I'm sure we'll be talking about that at some other point that was issued uh, late last week. So you should all have that link and that's an important vehicle uh, for laying out the future. Um, we do actually have a, an away day with the, um, with the integrated care system, the healthcare partnership during December. So um, any thoughts on that uh, would be helpful. And I know that we'll be bringing back to the board in January, the, um, the, uh, the result of thinking on how non-exec directors in particular should best engage with the ICS. And the final point is just to make, uh, just to say that the interviews are now uh, pretty much scheduled for our group posts and our hospital CEO posts in a week beginning the 14th of December. And uh, 
we're actively in the process of shortlisting for that in the next couple of days. And that uh, looks to have been a very successful recruitment exercise. And for those of you that are on the interview panels, you will know by now that they are long days, um, which is usually the sign of a successful recruitment exercise. So that's enough from me, unless there's any questions or comments about that. I'll go straight to Simon. Thanks, Alan. Morning, everyone. Um, a few things to update on. So the first um, matter that I tend to in, uh, in, in my report really reflects the ongoing work that we're doing on our vision, mission and values. Um, and indeed, um, other than the material that you see there, which remains in draft, um, we had a very successful um, session with the healthcare partnership in which we asked them to comment on this. And there was a, a, a lively debate, but the tenor of the conversation is probably the thing to report on. I think people really appreciated us reaching out and giving them the opportunity as partners to help shape um, what we do and how we do it. Um, and I know that there is a, a, a keenness that we carry on that conversation. So as we refine um, our group priorities and the work that we're actually going to do in terms of the practical on the ground day-to-day -day deliverables, um, they continue to be involved. But I think the conversation got off to a really good start um, and um, hopefully we will continue to do that. Um, the work itself continues apace. We're now well over a thousand people across the group having contributed to the material that you see there. Um, it continues to be um, a live debate. Um, the draft vision and mission that you see there has been uh, welcomed. I think um, we're now more in a place of um, working out what it means. So people seem broadly happy with the words that you see um, on the page um, and, uh, and we're continuing to seek comments and um, inputs into the process before we solidify it and we're on track to bring that back um, for final sign off um, at the end of January. Um, so I'd just like to thank everybody who's contributed and as I've said at all of the engagement sessions we've done um, Everything that people say does get, in this case, taken down and used in our in, in the way we're thinking about the world. And the conversations, I have to say, and um, uh, Eileen, Mark and Debbie from NGH and Andy have been joining me on some of those conversations, have been uh, really rich. We had a public engagement session just last week when, you know, the, uh, the range of different comments um, was really quite um, thought provoking from staff benefits and how do we continue to attract staff through to a, a real, I'm sure Andy would want me to say this, appreciation of the digital agenda on our, um, on our last public engagement session. Um, and finally, through to some quite challenging questions for us about how did we make sure that there was an equality of service access right across the county for what people um, uh, felt were important services for them. So um, lots of comments coming back to us. So it's proving the value of the engagement exercise. And I'm sure by the time we come back around in January, we will have a, um, we've got a rich body of material on which to, to, to finally sign off where we're going with the vision, mission and values. Um, I'll leave um, Eileen um, to perhaps pick up um, some of the more uh, detailed uh, operational issues in relation to COVID, but suffice it to say, um, we are in the thick of wave two, um, and that is with us right now. Um, we are um, turning our minds um, to the upcoming vaccination um, programme that will um, roll out. Um, at the moment, the operational arrangements for that are still being finalised, so I can't give more concrete information in public right now, but we are actively making um, preparations um, to get ready to roll that programme out. I'd like to thank um, uh, here um, everybody who's been involved in that. Um, as a group, we're playing a large part in the arrangements. Um, Chris Pallow, 
uh, Director of Strategy at NGH is the overall um, SRO for the programme. And he's supported by many colleagues now um, from across our group who are taking roles in terms of helping make sure the arrangements really are robust and sound. And when we, when we launch that we can do what we say we are going to do, we fully recognise, um, I think, the enormous responsibility of the public health effort that we need to make here. This is probably one of the most important things that we'll be doing over the next um, four or five months. Um, and it will be a programme of that duration to get to where we need to get to operationally. So in the meantime, then, um, obviously, uh, it follows that um, all of the arrangements that um, we've had in place around protecting our staff, protecting our patients, um, have to remain in place. And I would ask for everybody's support um, uh, in our staff, but also in our wider community to continue to maintain the vigilance that we've um, we've had to we've, we've had to have. It, it, it still is a really necessary part of what we're doing. We are, um, as I said, definitely not out of the woods and we won't be for some months yet. Um, and so the support that all of our communities have given us is fantastic and it has been fantastic over the last many months. And all I would ask is that you stick with us and bear with some of the um, uh, issues that we've had to deal with operationally so that we can uh, get through this as quickly as may be. So um, I'll pause there, Alan, and happy to take any uh, questions. Here's a lot in there, Simon, but are there any questions? I think most of you are well aware of the work on the, <clears throat> on the mission and vision and values. <clears throat> and I think everywhere we've taken it, people have been um, very supportive of the fact that we're linking, very strongly linking, uh, looking after our staff to looking after our patients and accept the argument if you look after your staff properly they look after your patients properly and that seems to be coming across very powerfully as is the commitment to um, inclusivity and collaboration which went which obviously was important to the healthcare partnership anybody at all i'm not getting any hands up there so i think we're all fine on that and there is more of course on covid later on um and there is more in, in, in private about the vaccination programme, which uh, we, unfortunately we have to keep in the private domain at the moment. So, Eileen. Thanks, Alan. Morning, everybody. So just a few things from uh, me. Um, the hospital is really busy, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware. This, uh, this we are predicting will be our peak week in terms of COVID. And certainly we had a very busy weekend. Um, all of that said, though, you will have seen uh, come to board uh, and various committees many times the reset plan which uh, Joe Forkus and the team um, have been pulling together about how we keep uh, other work coming in uh, particularly around some of our planned uh, elective work that has been deferred and also our, our cancer pathway patients and that all still continues it's a daily delicate balance I have to say because obviously with uh, 90 Covid patients in the hospital this morning um, what we have to make sure is that we can maintain red areas and green areas and, and don't get mixed up with those so uh, credit to the team for keeping going and we have taken that decision that we will we, we look at everything uh, forward look on a daily basis two days next week uh, just to make sure that we're operating safely but um, it is our intention to carry on for as long as we can and if we do have to take some elective work down it be for a very short period but at the moment we're doing just about okay and hanging on in there um, small matter of winter and winter planning. We've almost forgotten about winter because we've been in COVID for so long and it feels like one has just morphed into the other. But we have signed off the winter plan as a system now. And within that, uh, our extra um, there's extra capacity and extra interventions, which should mean and hopefully will mean that we can both hospitals will be able to continue to uh, get our patients through and maintain flow. Uh, and we are using the reason to reside framework to make sure that we looking we're looking very closely when patients are admitted that they are treated and moved uh, back to their home environment as fast as possible and if not what is their reason to reside so we're trying to give ourselves uh, a bit of uh, rigor as a system to make sure that we're working together and that's all moving 
I won't steal Mark's thunder, uh, but our flu vaccination programme has picked up a pace again. You'll see from my report that it was lagging slightly, but uh, somebody had the ingenious uh, uh, thought to actually uh, nab everybody as they came to pick up their lateral flow test from the recreation hall. Uh, and so as you were in the queue, you were uh, you were duly um, asked whether you'd had your flu vaccination and if you hadn't, you were done there and then. Uh, and that also went for the staff survey. So I think on Friday, we were up to 71%. And I think we are starting to move very much in the right direction. So we're expecting good things from that. Simon's obviously covered the uh, the COVID vaccination programme and um, it's uh, it's an enormous logistical exercise in a very short space of time, but uh, it will get done when as and when it becomes available. But it's, uh, it's no mean feat, that's fair to say. Um, and we're certainly as a system, I think, learning to be agile about how we uh, how we um, tackle things like um, flu vaccination and, and COVID vaccination programmes to make sure that we're being responsive. And just finally, at the bottom of, um, of my short report, I just wanted to mention that things do continue in terms of business as usual, because it's very easy to get consumed in the vortex of winter or COVID or whatever it might be. And so uh, November, we are, will see the launch and has seen the launch of our patient safety and continuous quality improvement campaign. And there are posters up all over the place. Uh, and each month we are going with a campaign on um, making sure that we are raising the profile of things that are happening within the hospital. And the idea behind the, this particular programme was to make sure that, um, that all of our colleagues and those working particularly in, in clinical areas and also non-clinical areas know uh, what we're doing as an organisation to improve uh, patient safety and uh, continuously improve quality because that is our business. So um, and that's the object of the exercise to make sure everybody knows what's going on uh, even if you don't happen to work in that area and that you're able to articulate uh, those things that are being worked on to make sure that we are continually learning. Uh, next, uh, so gosh, December tomorrow, isn't it? So December, we'll be highlighting uh, safeguarding in the digital hospital. So Andy will be absolutely in his element. Um, and uh, but that's how it, it started to run here. And it, it does seem to be a, a very effective way of, of getting messages out there and making sure that everybody becomes engaged. Um, and just a, a, a brief mention at the bottom, uh, we did, uh, our colleagues in the emergency department uh, did uh, have a, a CQC, did, were, did have a session with the CQC a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I think for those of us that have been either around Kettering for a long time or in and out of Kettering, we know that this has been a challenge team over the years, but it's probably fair to say that actually COVID has galvanized uh, the, the department and the team uh, more broadly. Uh, and the feedback that we've had from the CQC was that they were they were assured. And so really well done to the, uh, the ED team. They're not without their challenges and they've certainly borne the brunt of quite a lot of what's been going on this year, um, but they have managed to turn it uh, to their advantage in terms of how they work as a team and, and how they make sure and how they run their daily business and so I think the idea will be that they will come along to January board or soon into the new year to um, present their improvement journey and I think there's something they're rightly proud of and I think we should uh, acknowledge and congratulate them for their progress. Thank you Alan. Thank you I mean um, that was good stuff um, and I agree with you that the ED the emergency department took a a lot of the, the brunt of the problem and are again now as the numbers rise and the difficulty of maintaining social distancing while recognizing what's wrong with patients and how urgent they are and what their pain score is and all the rest of it so it is very difficult um i also i think we all recognize how incredibly difficult the covid vaccination program is going to be particularly because of the cold chain requirements of the pfizer vaccine which is really quite incredibly demanding technically and pharmaceutically. I'm an avid reader of The Economist and on Friday's one <clears throat> there's a lovely little bit, They're not, they don't give out praise very easily in The Economist magazine, there's a lovely little bit in Friday's one <clears throat> where they say unlike test and trace the government should be reasonably confident that the Covid vaccination programme will run smoothly because it's the NHS they're running it. And um, I just thought that was worth saying in this company. So, um, any other comments on the um, on Eileen's report? No, I want to circle back as well. Um, occasionally, I forget to say things because they are on the next page in my handwritten notes for this meeting. But uh, many of you will know we had a governor's election in uh, finishing last week, and uh, we're very pleased to welcome Sri Nair and Faisal Ryan as staff governors. Shri is our diversity lead and you know him well. Uh, Faisal is uh, an SPR, uh, a, a, a doctor uh, in the hospital. So we're particularly welcoming that because I think that kind of group of staff have been traditionally a bit underrepresented amongst the governors. 
And we also welcome as public governor, Sheila White, who you will know from before as a health watch governor, Eric Jackson and Sacha Biswan. And we are particularly delighted to recognize that Peter Rosecroft, who's with us today as our league governor has been re-elected. I hope Peter is as pleased about it as we are. It's always hard to tell. Yes, he does seem to be pleased. I was going to say it's always hard to tell with Peter whether he's really pleased or not. But we're very, very pleased that Peter and Mabel, uh, Mabel Blades and Mo Latif are also re-elected as governors. And there's a few applause and hands up for all of those re-elections. Uh, but I think particularly perhaps yours, Peter. So well done for that. And sad, sadly, we lost uh, Jen McCafferty as a staff governor who, um, who I think uh, resigned and... Um, Reg Talbot, who's been a governor with us for quite a long time and has a very pivotal role in the Finance Committee and as a reserve governor in the Quality and Safety Committee, was not re-elected in the East Cam's constituency. However, there may well be a, an extra seat available there if the Constitution is amended and we'd love to see Reg returning to the governing body. He's been a, a valuable member of the governing body. But, you know, as even President Trump says at the end of the day, you have to let democracy do what it does. So um, you're all very welcome and we are sorry at your loss, uh, at your, losing you from the governing body, Reg and Jen. Okay, that's that. Thank you very much. Um, integrated governance report. Um, are you running this, Leanne or Simon, or am I taking it through the various members? Um, I'll start on the quality and then hand over to Chris, if you wish, uh, Ellen. Okay, I have a running order here and I'll, I'll take it uh, the, uh, and handle the, the, the handover. So yes, Andrew and then on to Chris as chairman of QSC. Andrew. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, so I'll headline this by saying that the uh, quality section of Integrated Governance Report had a very detailed and thorough uh, exploration in the Quality and Safety Committee. However, um, there are some things I wish to draw to your attention. The first makes me feel like a harbinger of bad news. Unfortunately, we've had our first MRSA bacteremia in five years. And whilst being free of an MRSA bacteremia for more than five years is something to truly celebrate, the team feel desperately disappointed by this. Uh, and, but I am pleased to report that the patient is doing well and, and has recovered from this. Uh, and this was related to significant vascular ulcers on the patient. Um, we, um, when I raised complaints, I was actually, the reason I, I, I was asking James how many complaints we'd had, and he said 461, was that if I actually look at the number of patient contacts we have per year, around about one in 800 raises a, a complaint. So, I think that's a really important message to focus on. However, our response to uh, complaints isn't quite where it should be. Uh, last board, we reported a kind of a trajectory of improvement in, in, in September. However, that has degraded slightly and we've dropped from 61% responsiveness down to 49%. The major impact of this is within the division of medicine because it's big and that's where it's attracted most of its complaints. I would on a positive note point out that I signed off 20 complaints last week. So people are getting through them uh, at present. Um, in October, we had no falls with uh, moderate harm or above. However, I think it's important to draw to the board's attention that in November, we've had at least four and they are following their governance processes uh, at present. Um, on a positive, very positive note, we've had no never events. And the reason I mention this is because organizations within the East Midlands have experienced quite a number. And some of the learning that has come out of this is due to COVID and COVID pathways and the complexity of working elsewhere. Um, I've taken their learning and I've shared that with all of our surgeons. Um, so just to assure the board that despite the fact we haven't had any, we're not being complacent about that. Um, in terms of COVID, um, you've heard from Eileen that you know, the organization currently has 90 patients with COVID, five of which are on ITU. Um, what we've really struggled with then, and in, well, when I say we've struggled, everyone has struggled with this across the Midlands and all other organizations, in that we've had three outbreaks in October on various wards. And we've had five in November to date, uh, and three wards remain closed. We're not an outlier here, and we're not performing any worse than anyone else. 
and all the relevant uh, challenge and root cause analysis and learning is coming out of this. So it's important for us to, to recognize that. Um, but this causes incredible challenge to the delivery of services to patients. Uh, and uh, it's a bit like doing a, pile, a tile puzzle on a, you know, on a ship with a view of the tiles missing sometimes. Um, the Dipsy also presented a very detailed analysis of this at the Quality and Safety Committee, and therefore there's, there's a lot of sight on this. In terms of COVID deaths, we've had from the March to now 255 in total. However, since October and the second peak, uh, it's not really a second wave because we never, we, you know, we never finished the first one. Uh, the second peak, we've had 35 additional deaths and all of these have been reviewed by our medical examiners. And on a positive note, our HSMR is 101. So that's with expected. And I do believe I think we're the lowest in the region at the moment uh, in terms of HSMR. Our SMR, which also includes COVID patients uh, through viral infection, is 105. And that's also within uh, an, an expected range. Um, and then really finally, um, a lot of the work that's been done by the um, CQI or the KITE team has been around compassionism and their strap line is start every conversation with kindness, end every conversation with respect. Well, the KITE team had their CQI annual awards on Friday and I have to say it was really tremendous, uh, you know, a real feel good factor. The excellent work that has been done in the organization is truly outstanding and uh, so I thought I would end my report with respect to the kind team. Thank you, Andrew. Chris, anything on that? Um, Andrew's covered most of the points, but I'm just going to add one or two things. So first of all, with regards to the mortality annual report, uh, as the mortality rate is as expected, but I want to highlight the work of the Kettering Hospital Medical Examiner's team of which it should be really, really proud because it, from a year ago when it started to now, it is a really thorough going, uh, excellent team. And as someone who was involved with the national startup of uh, medical examiners some years ago, I'm really impressed by it. So um, thank you for the great work done by the medical examiners. Um, one or two specific other things. Um, we uh, continue, uh, as uh, we heard, to be undertaking elective work. And the really important headline is that there are no patients waiting more than 52 weeks at Kettering. I don't know if we're unique in the NHS in that position, but it feels like it because elsewhere the numbers approach often several thousand. Um, <clears throat> The final thing I would just mention is um, that um, the COVID um, is interfering um, with the situation, the delivery of care in terms of the uh, elective care. Uh, Andrew mentioned outbreaks. I just want to say to members of the public, an outbreak is not many patients, it is simply two patients and that is an outbreak. So it is a very, very low threshold. So when you hear that a ward has been affected by an outbreak, it can be two patients only, or two, two people, or two cases um, um, of COVID. Uh, and I think that's all I want to say, Alan. Okay, thank you very much. Any comment or questions on any of that? Um, boom, 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 boom. No, um, good then, thank you. Can we go to, straight on to PFNR, Joe, Joe, and then we'll hand on to Damien. Joe. Thanks, Alan. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, Chris, you've stolen my thunder there on the 52 weeks. Um, I want to just start with a few highlights around RTT, which was the 52-week position. I think we were one of three trusts in the country uh, maintaining zero weights, but it's a daily challenge and I just want everyone to note, um, as everyone has said around the puzzle and conundrum every day, that the teams are working really hard to maintain this position. Um, I would like to note um, RTT improvement, which is now 71.15%, uh, which is up from 58% um, in September. And again, 
just to note the challenges we face. All our theatres are not up and running, um, yet we're seeing a vast improvement in RTT, maintaining 52 weeks and, um, you know, managing patient safety uh, and flow and all the challenges within that. Um, super stranded, you will note, stays at an average of 73 for October. Um, you know, the daily work uh, continues with our system partners on that. And as Eileen said, the, the winter plan is signed off. And we have had new capacity come on stream this month for Pathway 3, uh, which is helping with our complex patients. So I'm hoping to see that number um, reduce. Um, cancer performance, um, as Andrew's referenced, um, again, we are trying to maintain that position, focus on our 62 day position, which is still not where we uh, want it to be. Uh, position for September was 78.9%. Um, we were forecasting to hit in October and that number is still being validated currently. Um, we still continue to work through the backlog of our patients, but I would like to note the excellent performance in two week wait and 31 days as well. It isn't just all about 62 day performance. Um, and finally, diagnostics, um, we still sit around 85%, so 15% of our patients are still over six weeks. Uh, the main issue being an MRI, but we have a full MRI recovery plan in place, which we did discuss at PFNR. Thank you, Damien, over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Well, look, I think um, between Joe, Andrew and Chris, they've covered all of the salient points. I think I saw it in the chat window from Simon, but it's worth bearing in mind that some of the performance metrics, such as the 52 week standard, are good news in the context of the, the wider uh, performance across the entirety of England. And you see that in some of the reporting metrics. So it, it's really good relative to how other trusts are holding up at this very difficult time. And uh, the only other thing I would do is uh, reiterate the, the thanks to the staff that are achieving this level of performance in difficult times. Thank you, Damien. When you're one of only three trusts in the country doing something, it's either a very bad thing or a very good thing. In this context, it's an extremely good thing and it does take an awful lot of effort to make this thing happen um, from the um, admin staff handling it through the clinical decisions to getting the people done. And as Joe said, there still are difficulties in our theatres and getting them open and getting the red and green sides working properly. Um, so that is, is just making life extremely difficult. Moving on, finance, Anil, and uh, back to you for Damien. Damien, after that, just to cover the finance bit. Anil. That's great. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to mention, in terms of our financial position, we've got revised arrangements for the second half of the year. Um, as you'll see from the PAC, um, we, we were better than planned by 100,000. Our deficit plan was 0.4 million pound deficit. We actually delivered a 0.3 million deficit. That 100,000 under spend is mainly down to uh, reduced pay and non-pay in terms of consumables and staff agency costs. Um, that was partly expected in terms of we expected it to be higher than it is, but we knew it might potentially be lower than that. Um, our capital spend position, again, we've got a £17 million plan for the year. We spent about £7 million to date. We're, again, we're reviewing our capital plan in relation to support required for COVID as we go through and updating our forecast to make sure we do spend our capital plan for this year. As part of our plan, we have a half million pound efficiency plan that is being delivered through those underspends to date. Um, and at this point, there are no major concerns around the financial position. Thank you. Yes, and nothing to add, a, uh, and nothing to unusual finishing comment from a finance director. But anyway, Damien. Yeah, sorry, nothing to add to what Anil yeah. said. I think he's covered it. Thank you very much. Any questions on any of that? It's all very clear, I think, and we've been through it all in committees. Thank you. Um, workforce, Mark, and then Janet. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, well, hard to be so concise after that finance report. That was amazing, Anil. So I, um, I won't go into too much detail in relation to the, the People Committee. Um, a lot of the statistics and, and information was discussed there. There are a couple of points I'd like to highlight, um, however, to the board. The first is obviously our increased um, vacancy rate position based on an increase in establishment. Um, and we are working towards that. And we've had some fantastic news um, in relation to international nurse recruitment from our national colleagues and from bids that we've submitted um, in terms of we've now received said funding and we will be um, developing our program even further um, and building upon that success. 
We also had a visit um, in October from the National um, Pay Review Body, uh, which was really important. They got to speak to a number of our staff in order to help make and inform their decision uh, to government. And I think that's really outstanding for a trust like ours to be represented and, and recognised in, in terms of that forum. So that was very, very good to have colleagues there. Absence is obviously a key um, situation for us at the moment as we deal with the pandemic and, and the second peak, as Andrew's described earlier. Um, we have a number of health and wellbeing activities which we've um, continued and some of which we brought back, um, which we had earlier on in the spring and we brought back ready for the winter, such as free hot meals for colleagues of an evening after and before a shift and so on and so forth. And that's going to be really, really important that we continue to maintain those sorts of things during the winter. Um, and ultimately that we continue to look out for each other and ask for help and support. Um, that's going to be ever so important as we, as we go through this winter period and dealing with the challenges that we are. We have a uh, statutory mandatory training position, which is not where we would like it to be, but obviously given the circumstances has dropped off ever so slightly. Uh, we're working with colleagues on that at the moment in terms of how to improve that and how to do things in different ways. So we are absolutely learning from uh, this pandemic experience, such as things around e-learning or um, appraisal lights and so on and so forth from statutory and mandatory position. I just wanted to take a moment, whilst not necessarily covered in the report, just to take a second to praise uh, the team that work with me um, across the group indeed, but especially within KGH at the moment. Um, at Eileen said that we had the flu position, which is now up in, in, the, in the mid 70s. We've had the staff survey that's concluded just on Friday evening, which is now at 58%, which is a 7% increase on last year. Given the circumstances that we're in, that's phenomenal. Um, and we look forward to hearing the comments back from that in due course, um, along with colleagues from Northampton General. Both staff surveys put together will give us over 5,000 voices um, in terms of where people are, are at, and, and that will obviously inform our people plan that's coming to the board in January. And I just wanted to also pay testament to the team in relation to lateral flow testing. So this is the testing kits that we're now giving to people for, to undertake self-testing. Um, we, did, we distributed over to those 3,000 colleagues last week in one week, which is incredible. Um, from just two weeks ago, we didn't know we were doing it, to last week, 3,000 people have got um, these lateral flow tests. And then obviously that's helping and, and hopefully will help with asymptomatic contract tracing, et cetera. Uh, it's fantastic. So the last I would end on is obviously we're, we're heavily involved in the COVID um, vaccination programme, and we'll talk about that later. Happy to take any questions, but I'll hand over to Janet. Janet, I think you might be on mute. I'm just trying to switch it off. Um, thank you. Um, so you've covered most of the things there, Mark. I would like to highlight um, a couple of things. Firstly, um, as you just said, uh, I would also like to uh, suggest that the innovation and responsiveness in HR practice to support the operational need at the moment is really fantastic specifically around the good networking and links, particularly with the Freedom to Speak Up champions, which has resulted in um, a couple of pieces of really significant work, um, identifying themes, for example, around bullying and harassment before they become issues, but also looking into flexible working for staff and being able to develop uh, further responsiveness to that. I'd also um, just like to add that uh, the uh, group uh, did look at the uh, BAF 005 um, and whilst we've got that later on the agenda that is in the process of being reviewed particularly with regard to the latest safe staffing report um, and clearly the workshops that we've been having with our colleagues in Northampton that have uh, discussed things like the staff survey, flu, COVID vaccinations, health and well-being and the NHS people plan have all been worthwhile additions to the work that we've done within Kettering. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. I'll just keep going with this. Um, anything from Audit Committee, Trevor? No, nothing from Audit Committee. It's on the papers for later. OK, thank you very much. Charitable funds, Janet, anything you want to bring to our attention? Um, uh, there, there are things later on in uh, discussion for the group, but uh, that has been the main focus of attention uh, latterly. Thank you. OK, and uh, Strategic Development Committee, well, you can't say that's not on the agenda today. That's the big ticket item at 12.45 or thereabouts, so we'll cover that at that point. And uh, Digital Hospital Committee. Uh, 
Andy and Alice. Andy, anything on Digital Hospital Committee? Um, yeah, just a couple of things. So obviously you've got the, the report there. Um, that, that was the last of the Trust Digital Hospital Committees that we had in November. Uh, we've held a retrospective to learn some lessons, you know, what worked well to take into the group Digital Hospital Committee, which will be in December. So that's that's kicked off. Um, we're, we're preparing to do, in effect, a transitional meeting in December before we sort of get into the swing of things properly in January. A um, couple of things to, to pick up on the the uh, update there. So the cloud first policy, um, again, I believe we're the first trust to actually publish one. Um, Damien's smiling because I don't never seem to tire to say that. But the interesting thing about that, it says led to some other conversations. So NHS Digital and NHSX have been in touch to ask uh, Kettering to be involved in, in some initiatives that are taking place nationally. So, you know, these things do have a, a ripple effect. Um, so we're looking to explore those. Um, and the other thing to mention on there just is, is the outpatients. Uh, this is a, a, a new, an opportunity to look at the end-to-end -end patient journey of outpatients and see where those digital services can improve that, that whole process. And I think, as Simon mentioned earlier on, one of the things that we heard from the public last week was actually their willingness to embrace uh, virtual consultations, receiving information electronically, engaging with appointment booking electronically. So some, some positive stuff there, and that will be uh, definitely what we call a service design approach, you know, looking at what the users actually want to uh, from that whole process. Um, so I'll, I'll finish there. Alice, you probably have got some other things you'd like to add. Uh, nothing other than what you've said and what's in the report, Andy. The message I would give is thank you to those who've helped um, on the Judicial Hospital Committee in the last year or so since it's been going. And I hope we can carry some of that learning forwards into the new group committee because it's going to have some, some big challenges on its list around the collaboration piece. So, um, yeah, really excited about getting started on that. Good. Excellent. I love the way... Being a glutton for punishment can translate into really excited, but I, I think um, there's a lot to be done on the digital, on the group hospital committee. So thank you for taking that on, uh, Alice and Andy. Um, and still with the Alice show, um, collaboration programme committee, CPC, Alice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you've got the pack in front of you, so I won't go through everything, but I just guess an opening message that thank you to everyone who's been continuing to contribute um, to the work of collaborating with Northampton. As we've said several times already, these are very challenging times and we are pleased that things are continuing with momentum, even in these times. Um, I think there's a quote, isn't there, that a year from now you'll wish you'd started today. And I think that's very much true with lots of the things we're doing at the moment for the CPC. Um, some of it we won't see immediate gains from, but in a year's time, we really will be glad we've started to lay the, lay the groundwork. So I suppose the things I would point, point out for the board and for the public would be, that we are continuing to progress the group vision and mission work that Simon referred to earlier, and that is coming back to the committee for a final um, final look in December to then come to the board in January. Um, and really pleased with where that's got to so far. I think another couple of things just to pull out, we spent a lot of time at the last committee discussing the clinical collaboration piece, which at the end of the day is the, the raison d'etre for this collaboration. Um, so it's key we don't forget that. Um, and we talked about a number of areas where we are particularly moving forwards in that. And we also talked about the importance of rolling out some organisational development support to those areas and to other areas as we come to them to make sure that we are really helping our staff to work effectively together. And we are not coming up against obstacles that we ought to have been able to see coming on that front. So that's something I think is going to be a key focus for us going forwards. Um, the other thing I'd say is we talked quite a lot about governance and committees, um, which is not always thrilling, but is really important. And I think on that, the key message is that we've made better progress than we thought we might have done six months ago. I think all of the committees pretty much are further forward in terms of collaborating, working as committees in common and so on than they expected to be when we first started to talk about this. So I think the lesson on that is um, something which I think a number of people have said is let's give it a go and see how it goes. And actually when we've done that, it's worked in a lot of cases better than we thought. And I think we're excited about the appointment of the remaining group roles that are, that are currently being recruited. Um, and that will really help us to move forwards at even greater pace in some of those areas. So, so yeah, really pleased that we are continuing to keep momentum going. 
Uh, so are we all, I think. So thank you for the work you do with Rachel and others to keep that show on the road. We might try and get you somebody to help with the report like everybody else, because you're carrying the burden of chairman all on your own there. Okay. Um, so I think we need to sort out something to do with the support. And I know the directors of governments are on that task. Okay, any questions on any of those uh, reports at all before I move on? I'm not seeing any hands up. I think they're all well understood and the paperwork in the, in the, in the board pack is, is very thorough. So, reset and recovery, phase three, another big problem everybody faces, but uh, Joe, tell us how we're doing. All right, thank you, Alan. Um, I think uh, I'll take you through some key highlights, uh, but broadly, um, we're on track and I'm, I'm really pleased with the work that the team is doing. And I think you will see that as I go through the report. Um, so we've already talked about the 52 week position, but if you look at the incomplete pathway position um, on RTT, it is lower than we forecast it to be. And I think that really highlights the work of the RTT team. It's not just um, about treating patients, although that's very important. Um, our RTT team are doing fantastic work in keeping in touch with our patients and making sure that our waiting list is validated um, and up to date and patients are getting dates for their treatment. Um, GP referrals is lower than we forecast uh, at um, 4251, we forecast 5375. Uh, we are working very closely um, with the CCG and others on this. Um, we have the capacity um, for GPs to send patients in. Um, we're not too sure why the numbers are lower, but um, I'd say we're working with the CCG on this. Um, art patient appointments, uh, in terms of first appointments, uh, we forecast um, three, four, three, five, but actually we had over 4,000 patients who attended the site. And that's quite phenomenal really, um, when we think about that we have lost outpatient space in creating our new same day emergency care unit. So again, the use of the space and, and how the teams are working is very creative. Um, in terms of uh, telephone um, appointments, um, first appointments, uh, we managed 2779 um, against a forecast of 3492. Uh, we have had some issues around um, use of telephone and virtual follow-up, uh, virtual appointments. Um, again, we're working through that with the team. Uh, in terms of follow-up appointments, face-to-face, uh, -face, again, we've been over plan. Uh, we're actually seeing 7651 patients against a forecast of 6248. Um, but I would like to highlight the telephone follow-up appointments, uh, which we followed up over 9,000 patients um, via the telephone. Um, in October and, and certainly the clinical teams um, are finding this a really useful way of um, talking to patients, communicating about their treatment plans um, and the next steps for patients. In terms of day cases and inpatients, um, as you will note, uh, day cases were almost there, 99% of where we said we would be and we're actually overperforming on inpatients. Uh, we had 333 treatments um, in October against a forecast of 301. And again, I'd just like to highlight the fact that we're not working with all our theatres. So, and it's a daily um, challenge to get everyone into beds and through our, our theatres safely, but we are managing to do that. Um, bed occupancy was lower than we forecast, um, and we have had many challenges around flow, as uh, Eileen has mentioned about red and green. And I would also like to note that during October, we shut our MAU um, for infection control work to be completed. <clears throat> so we, we're even working in a less of a footprint. So it just shows the excellent work that the teams are doing on the floor every day. Diagnostics, we are lower for MRI than we planned, but as I referenced, um, we have a full reset recovery plan in place now for MRI with extra capacity on site through productivity measures they have taken. And we have extra capacity coming um, off site uh, in January as well for MRI. CT, we're above forecast. Uh, endoscopy, we're under plan, um, except for gastroscopy, with, which we're over plan in. Um, and cancer, uh, I know that some of you have talked about cancer referrals. Um, and as you will see from the report, two week wait referrals are over where we said, where we thought they would be. We had over 1,000 referrals um, into us against a forecast of 816. Um, and that's, that's a really good sign that the GPs are referring patients back in and patients are actually going to see their GP as well. And of course, as I noted in my last report, we we're still achieving the two-week weights um, performance standard as well. 
And also we have fewer patients with a suspected cancer referral waiting over 62 days. So um, all in all, as Andrew said in the chat, um, we are doing excellent work around cancer. So broadly, we're on track. And I just again would like to thank the teams um, for the real focus on our patients um, and for our staff, given the challenges they're working in at the minute. Um, it's, it's really excellent news as to where we are. Thanks, Alan. I'm happy to take any questions. You're right, Joe, it is good news. And, um, you know, it's not been easy to recover from the effectively doing not very much for three or four months while we were all coping with COVID. Um, and it is important for the public to understand that the hospital is a safe place to come to and that their GP surgery is open and they should do something if they have a condition that is worrying them. And there's not many things health service can't do something about, provided you tell us about it soon enough. Um, so um, please think about that member of the public. Um, any comments at all on the phase three reset? A lot of data in there. Trevor and then Andrew. Thank you, Joe. Um, just one small thing. You said about additional MRI capacity. Is mm -hmm. that coming on site or is that going to be off site somewhere? And is there any risk around that? So in terms of MRI, um, Trevor, we have got uh, through the teams working uh, with infection control team, we've now got an extra 17 slots per day um, on site. Uh, and from January, we will have extra capacity off site um, and it will be um, at Corby. Right, thank you. Okay, uh, just to say, I can see the hands up function if you want to use that, but I'm reasonably happy with you sticking your hand up physically as well. Andrew. Alan, it was just really in response to what you said about the hospital being safe. Uh, an audit was carried out in endoscopy. It looked at over 700 patients who had attended endoscopy uh, you know, for diagnostic procedures, following them up. It followed them up immediately and then at two weeks. And of those patients, no one had contracted COVID as a result of attendance at the hospital. Thank you for that, Andrew, because that was clearly an area where everybody was very concerned about the aerosol generation that would come with it. And yet, even in that environment, it can be sorted, so to speak. Anybody else at all on any of the points there? Nope. OK, so um, we're still the uh, Joe Focus show. Winter plan, Joe? Yeah, thanks, Alan. Uh, um... So as we've referenced, the winter plan has now been signed off. Uh, the winter plan also has been through uh, QS and C and PFNR, sorry, Quality and Safety Committee and Performance and Finance Committee. So just bring into the board today for sign off, but also to note the risks around um, our plan, um, which are, uh, we still have a gap of 29 beds. Uh, we have got um, mitigations for that gap coming on stream in January. So I'm pleased to say that the um, extra beds we signed off for the NASB ward will be delivered in December, will be operational in January, and our other plans to release capacity uh, will also come to fruition in January. However, I do not know what's going to happen in terms of winter demand, and it could well be in excess of the um, activity that we forecast. But what I can say is that system discussions and system working has been excellent um, and we are working uh, with our partners across all our pathways to increase um, the capacity that we've got. So I just want to note those risks and for everyone to, to understand those risks that still exist. Um, what I would also say um, is that um, in the pack, you've got the full winter plan, how we've devised the winter plan around the OPA triggers, and we're trying to be more flexible in how we respond in the organisation. So we've got specific triggers for ED um, and social distancing in ED, and when ED becomes um, crowded, what we do in those circumstances, and they trigger actions on the OPAL scale. Um, and you will also see in the pack that we've got the incident room plan, because we are still in level four uh, national incident and how the incident room is working which now encompasses um, Brexit as well as winter. So it's, um, it's, all, it's all good fun in terms of how we're managing at the moment. I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has um, on the plan. Um, and everyone has said, you know, obviously how winter is going at the minute. We are busy uh, and we have had to use our triggers and tools in our plan. Um, and it's been great for learning and planning as we've gone along. Thank you, Joe. Um, normal, well, A, it's obviously later than normal, which is hardly surprising and a bit predictable. We normally have been doing the winter plan a little bit earlier. 
And um, the other thought that occurs to me is normally when you're doing the winter plan, you're kind of debating about 1% growth in this or a 2% growth in that. Whereas this year, the numbers are off the scale in terms of predictability or unpredictability. So ne the necessary machinery behind that in the site teams and the operations room and all the things that go with that are going to prove to be very, very important. Um, Simon. Um, thanks, Alan. Um, just firstly, to add my um, thanks uh, to the ops team for all they're doing. Um, um, we are spinning three plates at the moment, the COVID plate, the winter plate and the recovery plate. And the team are doing an exceptional job keeping all of those plates in the air and going at the moment. And so it's important, I think, that Joe, you convey our thanks to them for all that they're doing. Um, secondly, of course, um, I'd also like to publicly mention and thank our, our partners. Um, uh, our social care partners are um, really helping at the moment and their work in keeping our patient flow going. Um, we should know that and appreciate it. And they particularly um, stepped up to the mark um, over this last period, as, um, as Andrew's rightly put it, the second peak of COVID has come upon us and um, working at weekends to really help pull patients out so we can maintain our bed flow um, and I just wanted to take a moment to thank them for their ongoing contributions that we couldn't do what we do without them and what they do um, so um, just to say those things so if you could convey our thanks Joe that'd be great and if we could note our mm -hmm. thanks to social care um, for all that they do um, that would be also great. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, a couple of comments in the chat. Could you just cover them, which is um, both in terms of our recovery and in winter pressures, how is our use of woodlands or the private sector in general going? And then a little question around the um, 111 controlling uh, emergency, non, 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 or whatever the phrase is, non-urgent, urgent, non-urgent non emergency department attendances and so on. So uh, just if you could think, give us a bit of an answer on both of those, presumably it's Joe or possibly Aileen, but Joe. Yeah, in terms of uh, Woodlands, we have 22 uh, lists a week at the Woodlands. Um, as you can imagine, that's quite a logistical operation, Alan, uh, to keep that going. Um, the Division of Surgery and the RTT team are working very closely with the Woodlands team on, on getting uh, patients booked into those lists. Um, as with anything, there's challenges around it, but um, overall, it's a, it's vital capacity to us, and uh, we certainly couldn't manage without that capacity currently. Um, in terms of the other question around 111, um, uh, we launched our 111 um, in October, the pilot in October, I think it was the end of, around about the 26th of October. It's too early to say, Alan, attendances have been down um, in terms of um, those coming through minors. Uh, we have streaming patients now to minor injury and minor illness, and we've got the 111 in place. So it's too early to say, but I think as we go through the next few months, we'll have a look at the figures in more detail, and I'll certainly bring that back to the board committees. But um, from the feedback from the ED team is there, they think it's having a positive impact and patients are being streamed to the right services, um, and the 111 element of that is working well in their mind currently. And do we have a particular community comms uh, programme there, or are we just riding on the back of the national comms programme for our, our residents to understand what they should be doing around minor illness, minor injury? Yeah, it's a national one. And also there's a system one, Alan. Uh, we've been working with our system partners um, to, to, to do the whole 111 thing. So we've gone on the back of all of that. Um, but there'll be more to come on that in, in, as we go through the next few months. Okay. Any point? No, I'm not seeing any other hands up in the in the hands up box or any chat comments in the chat box. So um, uh, you're due a break now, but you've all done so incredibly well. You're going to get a reward. You're going to get to go straight on to the next item, which is the board assurance framework, and we'll do the break after that. Um, Richard. Thank you, Alan. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much I can fill the time out with such a riveting item as the board assurance framework, but I will do my level best. So. The BAF is presented to the board as a snapshot of its position at the 4th of November. Um, and um, 
uh, each of the risks on there have undergone um, continuous review and have been through the board committees allocated to them. Um, just to highlight that a deep dive review of BAF 10, which is the preparedness for COVID risk, has been undertaken with the Director of Medicine and the Director of Nursing, myself, and the Director of Infection Prevention and Control. And whilst we have updated that with a range of additional controls, further planned actions, and the assurances that are available to us, that did not have any impact on the current likelihood or consequence, and therefore the overall risk score. Other than that, just to say that the deep dive reviews of BAFs continue to happen through committees on an ongoing basis. And the report is there for questions and assurance for the board. Okay, um, any questions or comments about uh, the board assurance framework? We, we know now that this has gone through a rigorous process. Nevertheless, it's still important that the board sees and understands its major risks. Alice. Thank you. Just a question, really, around the risk that centres around commissioning out of hospital care. I think when you look at the risks overall, that one, well, it's obviously the, the highest rated. And I guess as somebody that's not in a committee that goes through that risk, it would just be welcome to have some context about why that is felt to be the most significant at the moment, I guess. OK, so I'd invite um, Joe and perhaps Damien from an FPC point of view to respond. Sorry, just coming off mute. Um, I think we obviously have to review these things as we go along, Alice, but um, you know, uh, we've signed off the winter plan. We've been in lots of discussions with our system partners. The last few weeks in particular um, have been fantastic in terms of uh, those discussions around capacity. Um, we now have the news that the specialist care centres um, are back under the control of um, the council that will release even more capacity into us, which we hadn't factored in previously. Um, so I think it was just the whole risk around where we've been in previous winters around out of um, out of hospital capacity and, and what's been going, up, going on across the system. So I think I have to review that again um, in light of, of recent developments. Um, but as Simon said, over the last few weeks in particular, you know, we have seen a, a major um, upturn in, in, in capacity. So um, I will review that again. No, that's helpful. Thank you, Joe. Okay, Simon. I can just pick up on that point. Um, we're going to be taking a paper later on on the board talking about um, system by default and what that means for Northamptonshire. And one of the key strategic questions that we need... To, excuse my... Um, so it's not only you, it happens to Alan. Um, um, one of the key strategic questions that we need to be able to answer is what's an acceptable level of occupancy in our acute hospitals in Northamptonshire? That is not just a question for us, that is a question for our partners. The work that we've done, extraordinary and uh, 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 praiseworthy though it is, is a special cause variation. It's not the answer to the underlying strategic question about where do we intend to get to? Uh, so I think um, this will continue to be a risk for us because even if we move beyond the current sort of immediate operational circumstances, um, we have to conjure a level of occupancy that will support the building of new hospital estate, which we're going to be debating later on. So my own view is that um, we've got to answer that question as a system. Um, what is an acceptable level of occupancy for our acute hospital estate? And that's beyond just us in KGH. It also applies to NGH. Um, and good though the work that uh, we have been doing to keep the flow going, the reality is that both hospitals are occupied 95% plus most days of the week. And that is not a sustainable position either for patients or for staff or for partners. So we need a, an answer to that question. So my own view is that that risk will probably need um, reparsing, but it will be there until we feel we have got that answer to that really, really important question that um, the system needs to grapple with. More generally, um, we know, um, that the planning guidance is imminently about to be published, um, phase four letter. And so one of the things um, I'd like Richard working with the committees to do 
is to take a forward look of risk um, um, and do a bit of a horizon scanning exercise about what risks we may be coming to four or five months down the line post winter. So an example of that, we know already um, that next year um, we're going to be in the throes of an elective recovery programme nationally. And so the question that we should be thinking about now are, are we tooled up to be able to deal with what will be those challenges? Um, because um, they will be significant. Um, we have done very well so far, but we um, need again to think about, are we really in the place to deliver what's required locally, not just in Kettering, but across the group in Northamptonshire, because um, we need to deliver for the people of Northamptonshire. So I'm just inviting Richard, I suppose, a horizon scanning exercise across each of the committees in the context of the new planning guidance to say, does this planning guidance, when it comes out, give us pause for thought in any area that where we think maybe we just we're not we're not quite ready to, to deal with that challenge? Um, because we've got an opportunity with the breathing space that we've managed to get ourselves to really take a chance and look forward as well as respond to what's in the here and now. Thank you, Simon. I think that's a, an ideal opportunity to focus on some of the, when we get to that point later on in the agenda, some of the committees in common where we're working in partnership with Northampton to look at those horizon scanning risks together as a group as well as two separate trusts. Thank you. Um... Simon, yes, good stuff. Lisa, you're, you're muted, I think. No, I'm coming. Um, yeah, mine was much more um, kind of uh, practical. So actually just to give assurance to uh, around the bed occupancy at quality and safety, we had a really good discussion about actually the added complexities of, we mentioned the outbreaks. And we, we mentioned something that I've never heard of before, trapped beds. But actually where you have somebody with COVID, that automatically means the people around, you've got less mobility and it really does kind of make managing the day to day uh, and the red and green much, much more difficult. So it's really to give assurance that at, at QNS we had a, a, a good debate around the complexities. Okay. That was good, and I think we're pretty solid on our understanding. The forward view that Richard through committees will be very good, and that can come back in due course. I don't see any other hands up, so I Janet. Oh, sorry, Janet's hidden behind my chat, and she I think sometimes hasn't got the ability to raise her hand electronically. Janet, no, I haven't today, but here I am. Um, I just mentioned earlier on about the uh, BAF 005 and the safe staffing report, and I think the points that have just been raised. Uh, we did have some discussion in the um, uh, People's Committee, particularly around the challenges that our workforce are facing in uh, this really complex uh, healthcare situation, where they're facing COVID, winter pressures, and attempting to deliver uh, online in time. And um, I think that's important, taking on board everything that's been said, that when we do the deep dive, we, all dive, we also do the horizon scanning. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Janet. Um, all good, clear, board assurance framework stuff. And I think we're finished now. Mark, I'm assuming I can't come back to your item on celebra uh, celebrating equality and diversity till the time it's scheduled for, 12.05, is that right? We have other guests joining us at that time. Uh, we do still have Anna on the call, who's also going to talk about this item. So I don't know if we want to put her under that much pressure to say it's ready now or not. <laughs> Haley's uh, also was, managed to join us early. I wasn't thinking of going now. I just wondered if we could come in maybe 10 minutes earlier and start with Anna as we were planning to do. Is that all right, Anna? Good. Yeah. So in that case, you've earned yourself a 25, uh, slightly less than 20, uh, yeah, 25, 27 minute break, uh, five to 12. Um, uh, five to 12 would be the return time. Please remember the streaming is still live. If we are going to, uh, the microphone should be muted and you can stop your video cameras. Thank you very much, everybody. Five to 12.
Okay, everybody, we should all be back. Are we still live, um, IT people? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So we're all back 11.55 and we're into celebrating equality, diversity and inclusion in our workforce. Now we had a long session on this or a good session on this in our October development session, but the timing ran a little bit awry because of the enthusiasm of some of the presenters. So we have um, Anna, Karen, Haley, and Carol coming to talk about their experience today. We're a little bit ahead of the original schedule, so we're starting with Anna, but Mark, I think you're going to introduce this first. Good morning, thank you, Alan. Yes, yes, correct. So following our, um, our board development conversation in Black History Month in October, um, as Alan said, we had a number of stories uh, which were really amazing to hear and to help share and um, people's experiences to help our understanding and, and aid our learning um, in terms of what we can do differently in the future in relation to diversity um, and inclusion. We had a um, presentation from one of our international nurses. So we had a number of presentations, but one of the ones from our international nurses, and we're gonna hear from, her, um, from Haley and Karen a little bit later on um, in relation to uh, our response to that. So what is it that we are doing? But first and foremost, uh, we have Anna who's already been and a number of occasions this morning, um, who will be presenting her particular story to us. Then we'll move straight into Haley, and then we will take any questions at the end of that, if that's okay by everybody. So I, um, I'm hoping I will see Anna. She's not on my, she's not on my screen. Anymore. I'm here. And here we are. You can see Anna, and I am then hoping that Richard uh, May is working on your slides. Here we yeah. are. That's it. Thank you, Anna. Okay, I'll try, I'm going to try my best to keep to time with this. Uh, and I just want to first say, before I forgot to, forget to say thank you to Simon Weldon, Leanne Hackshaw, and Andy Callow, and also D Joe Dilley, and other members of uh, the team that have been absolutely instrumental to me having confidence within the organisation. So um, can I move to the next slide, please? So for people that don't know me, I'm the Chief Allied Health Information Officer at Kettering General Hospital. But I'm going to talk about my journey uh, from when I started in the organization. Can we have the next slide? I can't see the slide. So I'm gonna talk about my journey within, the, within my time in, in the organization. I started working at Kettering General Hospital on the 4th of December, which I must say is my, is my birthday um, in 2017. And just to show how excited and, and I'm a normally very enthusiastic person. And um, I started on that day and I was absolutely extremely excited, but I'm hoping I can get these slides up so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about and um, understand the journey I've had so far within the organization. I'm yeah, sure Richard's getting them up. For a minute, Anna. Who's, who's doing the slides? Mr. May is doing them. I'm sure he's working on it right now. I'm sure he is. Just wait. Just pause wait one minute. second. So we come up. It is, of course, entirely possible you might have to wing this, you know? <laughs> we'll we'll find out in a minute or two. Just pause and let the process catch up. I don't know if you can see my slides. There you go. Can you see my slides? I don't know if that's any. Is yeah, that's great, Anna. Is yeah, it big enough? Great, to... Anna. Thank you very much. It's just as well you're an information officer. <laughs> okay, so if you can see the slides, thank you for telling me that you can. So in 2017, I started within this organization as a transformation program manager. And the only reason why I applied for the job was because it said um, BAME staff welcome. And that was my only reason. I would not otherwise have actually applied for the job because I found that every time I, I applied for a job, even though I've got a master's in a project management, I've got a degree in biochemistry, and I've also got my clinical um, um, certification as an operating department practitioner and a lot more um, for some weird reason either wasn't shortlisted or I felt that still something that was just a, you know either a glass ceiling that did not let me move any further but 
to my surprise, I got shortlisted at Kettering General Hospital and uh, went for the interview, not realizing I was going to get the job. Now, when I got the job, it was absolutely, as you can see on my slides, I was absolutely excited. I've got this really big, happy face. And just to walk you through, through these slides, the first graph here shows me just as a general overall, everything that makes me who I am. So the second bit of the um, graph shows the impact of unconscious bias and how it's played um, within my journey here as a BM, BME staff. So, um, and I just put there again, some of the projects I've worked on during the journey uh, with Kettering General Hospital. And I'll say to you that, as you can see from the slides, when I started it within the organization, I was quite neutral when it came to unconscious bias and how I was going to be treated and, and how, I, you know, how I just felt in general about racism or discrimination. I didn't know what was gonna happen. Not saying I didn't have any negative experiences during that time, but I think there were manageable negative experiences. But I think in 2018, while still as a transformation program manager, I had a bit more negative experiences within the organization. Overall, it still felt left me feeling quite neutral about my position within this organization and how I should react to people and how I should behave around certain sets of people. And I think it made me quite uncomfortable. But even at that, the personality I have is quite strong. I'm quite happy all the time. And I just had to keep being positive. And I think positivity was what, one of the things that made me move forward. I then, in 2019, um, I was excited again because I think, you know, like I was back at a neutral stage when it comes to, you know, that impact of unconscious bias. Um, and it was because I got the job as a chief allied health information officer full time. At first it was part time and then moved to full time. But what that showed me was people are listening and people were paying attention and people understood that there was something in me that I could share. And then Further to looking at 2020, we can see what's happened here again is the fact that I've, in terms of unconscious bias and maybe microaggressions within the organization, it's pulled me back to a very kind of unhappy state on that line. But overall, I'm very happy where I am in terms of within the organization. Now, I'm not trying to sugarcoat this, it's just my experience. And it's more around what are the, what am I experiencing within Kettering General Hospital? It's positive, but it could be better. And I think we've got to realize that there are two forces here. Whereas if I look at other colleagues that are not from my background, that line will not be there. That line that is of an impact of unconscious bias. There might be a third layer, which is more around bullying and harassment that, you know, if you add this to, to you know, the graph, it might have a, different impact on people in general. But we're looking at now the BAME staff. There's this line that a lot of people do not see and do not understand exists that they're working with and is affecting and having an impact on their day-to-day -day running within the organization. So I think as an organization, one of the things that we can possibly do is, and we are doing right now, is to start listening and learning from these stories. Because I think I would rather be at the excited all the time phase within the organization and just be extremely happy to be where I am. But I have had moments when by I've been absolutely, because of this impacts of microaggressions, it makes me not that, for example, A, doubt myself about my abilities. It makes me unsure if I want to be in that place. Um, and do I want to remove myself out of where I am? So I think it's quite emotional. And I think when it comes to an emotional um, feeling, it has an effect on our physical, mental well-being. And as ethnic minority people, I think it's one of those things that it's quite difficult to articulate to people to say, this is what I'm going through. This is the impact of other things around me that might not have anything to do with your manager. It might just be external forces that are within the organization that are having an impact. But I won't dwell long on this particular slide because there's other things that I'd love to share about you know, wonderful things that have happened in the organization. And I'm just gonna pick out a couple of um, projects that I've worked on. So I've worked on some key projects like vitals and virtual visiting. And the fact that 
it has been successful. Other things like the alcohol and tobacco um, sequin and different other things within the organization. I think it's just to show testament that without the, su the support of my the management team, without the support of people across the organization, I would not be successful in achieving the things I have achieved as an ethnic minority person within the organization and just shows testament to the type of people we have within the, sh the, the floor, within the organization that are ready to work with me and work with the teams in general. This is this slide just looks at virtual visiting. And when we started in July, the numbers of um, virtual visits across the organization, it shows how that has exponentially kind of shut up in terms of the amount of visits. We are now at over 1,500 visits across the organization with most book visits with Harriton AMC. And like uh, James alluded to earlier, the average visit time at the moment is 52 minutes across the organization. I think for me, it's quite interesting because this project has actually taught me a lot more about who I am and about what our patients need within the organization. So I'm just going to just celebrate again the, the fact that we have got 1,500 plus virtual visits across the organization. Now, what I enjoy most about my role, just skipping back into that, is not knowing what will happen next. And I think that makes life absolutely, you know, for me, exciting. And just the fact that patient experiences are very, very important and instrumental to making what we are doing as, you know, managers, you know, even much more important. And not only our patients, our, our staff as well being able to listen to them and listen to the stories. And just one other thing I'd like to share again is more around the virtual visits and the fact that we are having this campaign around ensuring that we get that virtual Christmas table, get everybody that are within our care within the hospital on that virtual Christmas table. And what I will ask from this wonderful group is around, um, this board is around ensuring that we support this and ensure that everyone within our trust uh, they, they sign up to this and make sure that everyone within our trust gets a virtual visit and gets to say, you know, Merry Christmas to their loved ones. And this is just some few, you know, pictures of staff and just you seeing the um, excitement and the importance of what we have done as an organization together. One other thing that um, agenda for me that is very close to my heart is about the digital ambassador program and it's just a brief whistle stop around the fact that it's um, going to be um, a program that will support staff on their digital journey across the organization and we're looking at how we can improve digital literacy across the organization and I'm willing to share a bit more on that but just before I go one of the things I want to just say is why, what, why is it that most attempts at racial equality is not taken, has not taken us further? Is it the fact that people, we are unable to establish the depth of the problem or, but, or is it yet that, as a, is it not as important as, as our day job? Do we see it, um, racial equality, not as, in, not as important as that day-to-day -day job that we're doing? Or is it just that we want a quick fix? So, you know, we don't want a quick fix. We want it to be a thing that is continuous and it's it's seen and we are heard. And also, is it because the organization that you know are, you know, that they are um, they address what they see and um, unaware of what they what they do not see? So do we just address the things that we see and not the things that are under the surfaces that people unfortunately um, are unable to share. So how do we actually do that as an organization? I just leave that question um, and just that those thoughts out there. And just to say to everybody, please keep making sure that we wear our face coverings and wash our hands. Thank you very much. Wow, Anna, thank you very much. That was a, that was a really incredible and thought provoking presentation. And thank you for uh, also showing us your uh, digital skills uh, and being able to share your screen with us. So, so my plan is we'll then move now into a presentation from Haley in relation to um, international nurses. And I hope, Anna, you can hold on for us for another 10 or 15 minutes, just so I'm sure there'll be some questions from board colleagues um, in terms of a number of the um, really serious and important points that you've raised. So if I can then move into the presentation from Haley. Thank you, Mark. I'm gonna attend, oh. I was going to say, I'm going to attempt to share my screen because I'm not very good at technical things as much as Anna, but 
um, looks like my presentation is there. So I again just want to say thank you to everyone for letting me come and talk to you. Um, my name's Hayley Burns. I'm lead nurse for practice development. And I've been um, in this role for the past two and a half years. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our International Return to Practice program. Um, so I've broken it down, as you can see, into past, present and future. And there's a little video at the end, which I'd like to share with you um, about um, what the program is, has been like and what we'd like to return to. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of background into the programme that we offer. Um, we started in 2016 with a very small practice development team um, and we started our international return to practice programme. The reason for that was because we noticed there was a lot of um, nurses in the trust that were working in healthcare assistant roles or assistant practitioner roles in various areas that were nurses in in their own right but were unable to practice as such in this country because they hadn't gone through a international conversion program um, that had been built on from when we'd done um, EU recruitment in the previous few years so what we wanted to do is transition those trained skills that un untapped workforce to enable us to um, fill some of the gaps that we had within the nursing workforce here at the trust and um, that was mirrored across, across the country as well. And as we all are probably aware, there's still a large vacancy of um, nurses across the country. What we had noticed is that there were some challenges facing this group because we didn't have a way to help them progress their careers. A lot of them wanted to develop, wanted to um, move forward, um, you know, get higher skills, um, higher um, levels within the trust but there, were, there was no way for them to do that at the time so that's why we introduced our program and in 2017 um, to 2019 95 nurses completed that program um, in this year alone in 2020 there's been 98 so in those three years we had 95 in this year alone we've had 98 so the program has built on year on year on year um, approximately seven percent of um, the nurses that we trained have gone into more senior roles within the organization whether that be deputy sisters um, sisters and charge nurses or um, specialist practitioners in many different roles in 2019 um, a small group of the practice development team, as well as the HR and recruitment team, did a trip over to um, India, um, where there was a big recruitment drive, and we recruited over 100 more nurses at that stage. If we can go to the next slide, please. So that's a little bit of background. It brings us into the present now. And as I've just discussed, in 2020, we've had a large expansion of our international return to practice program. Um, we've managed to maintain our success rate and we're one of the only trusts, if not the only trust in the country that still has a 100% success rate. And that is from the beginning of our program in 2016 until now. Um, so that's something that we're very proud of. And that's what a lot of um, candidates come to us from lots of different areas and from all over the world because they know that um, we have a 100% success rate here in the trust. What we have noticed um, by doing the program and as was shared with um, Christiana, who um, shared her experience last time at the board meeting, was that um, after sharing their experiences, we noticed there was some gaps in the additional support after our OSCE program. So we're very good at training the nurses and getting them through the program, but there's some things that we could be doing better to improve um, work out on the wards, relationships, and how people integrate into the trust. So as you can see here, it just showed that there was a bit of um, loss of relationship building and a loss of sense of community. So some of the things that we've been trying to do to address that is we've created a finding your voice forum. 
um, which has some of the candidates who want to talk to us, who want to give us feedback, who want to share their experiences. Um, it also has the learning and development team. It has international return to practice um, representatives. We've also looked at how can we redesign the program so that we incorporate some of these um, relationships and community building work. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So as it says here, what we want the future to be after listening to our colleagues, um, listening to their experiences, we're relaunching the program. We want to use um, a structured approach to supernumerary um, period to ensure that staff are integrated into their local workforce teams as well as the wider trust team. We want to have an increased visibility of the practice development team out on the wards, supporting individuals. They build a good relationship with them when they're doing their OSCE training, but they can also be a um, source of comfort, a friendly face that they know if there's something they're struggling with that can help them to integrate better into their teams. They're finding your voice forums, which are... Um, we're planning for the whole year to just give people if they want to drop in or they want to share experiences they can do and then introduce the reintroduce the importance of the community and relationship building so i've got a little link here so i don't know if that link will work to the the video if i've sent it i don't know give it a try play it it was active so if not i'll try and log on to youtube and see if I can share my screen because it's a nice little video which just shows what we're trying to get back to if if not let me try and see if I can yeah. bear with me I'll see if I can get it up on my screen because I think it's quite a good um Video Stand by Hayley, I'm just oh. bringing it up for you. Oh, okay, thank you. You happy for this to play? Yeah. you um i just wanted to share that video with you because that's some of the things that we want to get back to that um learning about each other building relationships not only in work but outside of work building a community building a network of support um sharing experiences with each other having fun yes trying to get to a um combined goal of achieving your oski and achieving your nmc registration but also developing developing a community and wanting to put roots down here and stay here at the trust and in the local area build your families have your children go to school here and and just have that longer term 
sense of community really so thank you for letting me um share that video with you and that's our aim that's what we're trying to um return back to you. so thank you for your time thank you Haley and, and Anna and uh, and two fantastic presentations I'm sure maybe you can see in the chat there's a lot of uh, a lot of kudos going your way and, and it's always brave to show a video on a, on a live zoom call too so thank you very much to Richard and Kieran with helping out with the technology as well so um, just mindful of our time on this particular item, there's some fantastic work. Um, I'm running out of superlatives in terms of the teams and things that we're bringing together, whether that be from a patient experience and the virtual Christmas and Anna's story, or whether that be from a staff experience and, and the story we heard from both Christiana in our last board development session and indeed uh, the response to that from Hayley today. So I, my plan around this section, Alan, was to hand back to you for any questions. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, Thank you, um, Anna and uh, Harry. Um, good stuff. And, um, you know, when you recruit internationally, which clearly we have to do as a nation, um, and indeed worldwide, there was a short, massive shortage of, um, of nursing staff. Patient, people you are recruiting literally have thousands of hospitals to choose from. So there's got to be something that makes you a bit different. And the answer is the 100% success rate in the international recruitment program and come and meet your friends. So well done everybody for that. Uh, open for comments and questions, please. I've got uh, Lisa and then Simon. Always have your mouse in the wrong side of the screen when you want to go to unmute. Um, great presentation, great video, lovely to see so many smiling faces. I suppose, um, it's great to see a response to some of the issues that were raised at the last presentation about understanding culture, etc. And I just wondered, what was the link then between the return to practice program um, for people local to Kettering or moving into Kettering? Are we making sure those two programs are linked? Um, yeah, what we've noticed is obviously our colleagues who are coming from internationally as opposed to who have already worked in the trust who were HCAs and assistant practitioners, those individuals um, seem to have already built those relationships because they've been here a little while. So obviously they would be incorporated into the OSCE programme in the same way. But what we've noticed is obviously it's a huge jump coming from India or Nigeria yeah. or wherever they're coming from that we need to make sure that we understand them as a person first as well as yes getting them through the OSCE program and making sure that they're, they're on the wards and stuff but just listening to who are you as a person not just as a nurse um, you might have something in common with the person sat next to you and how can we help you to communicate with each other and um, build those relationships as like we were discussing that's that's the important thing and that's what we've noticed from some of our colleagues being able to share the stories that it's that sense of community that they lack and that's what we're trying to make sure by redesigning the program, by offering the Finding Your Voice forums, by um, doing some silly little games it, as part of their program. Who are you? And um, bring something in that day that tells me a little bit about you that will help get questions going and that we can share with each other. And that's the important thing that I think that we're trying to get back to now. Hopefully that answered your question. I'm sorry if it didn't. No, it did. It was great. It's, it's a really good program. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Simon. Thanks, Alan. Um, great job, both of you. Fantastic um, presentations. Um, so um, a question for Anna would be, um, what can we do as a board to get behind the virtual Christmas? Because if we should, you know, be getting behind anything, um, it's trying to make sure, you know, anybody who wants a call at Christmas um, who can't otherwise get one can get one. Yeah, and there were a couple of comments in the chat about what could we do to help. So perhaps you could let us know there are things that we could do to help. Um, Haley, a kind of related question, really. What can we do to help support the finding, you know, the, the restart of the programme? Um, I was interested, I suppose, just to point to a, a, a more specific item, too, about the number of people who've gone on to more uh, senior roles who've gone through the programme because we know that one of the things that colleagues from Bain communities have said to us is that 
access to some of those management opportunities is not doesn't feel equal. Um, that's the lived reality of people, isn't it? And is there anything that we can do to help with that? Or is there any comment you'd like to make in terms of that particular area? Um, what I'd pick up on, Simon, is what you've just said in terms of the um, candidates who are progressing in their careers. What we've noticed is there is a bit of a gap of them understanding what they should do when they're applying for different roles. Um, so what information is required in their support and information and um, those kind of things. So we are putting together as part of the programme um, towards the end. We have a bridging programme now, which we do after the um ski um, to help them as part of their staff nest development and their ongoing development so we're putting those kind of things in to help them understand what is required because they are very ambitious a lot of them have ha a lot of skills a lot of training their um you know master's level and and um things back home so we're trying to integrate things that they need and look at talent spotting where do they want to go do they want to go clinical do they want to go leadership so um i think what we need is just to understand where they're coming from so that goes back to again who are you what do you want to achieve how can we help you so we've started that process already um, and i think we've noticed that having the bigger cohorts that um, obviously there's themes that are coming through which we're now starting to work on. Okay, okay. everyone, um, I'm not seeing any more questions or hands up in the chat box or in the chat box. Look guys, that was really good. Could we uh, hear from, uh, could we hear from uh, Anna? It was almost, it was all, sorry, somebody could say something? Could we hear from Anna just to give her an answer? I asked her a question too about- Oh, sorry, sorry, Simon, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Alan. Um, it's more around um, fueling the movement, I think, from senior execs. I think when there's that engagement from the senior execs and the ward member staff can see that um, there's that buying, uh, then what that, that does, it also encourages them. So if even if it means um, senior execs either calling on the wards, finding out how many patient, patients um, they've already booked or, you know, things around that and just show their their involvement, if it's Twitter, whatever it is, and just saying, I'm signing up to the virtual visit around the Christmas table and something around that and just what can we do to ensure that um, patients on the wards, you know, are actually going to experience a wonderful Christmas this time. And also iPads and iPad stands, I think, um, and what Joe, Joe um, and um, James alluded to earlier around the staffing um, for people that are unable to hold the, the iPads. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I don't think there'll be any shortage of people willing to promote that. And we have had a lot of support from our community in all sorts of things during the COVID pandemic so it may be that there are some organizations within the, the county that might wish to help with the provision of stands or ipads and i'm sure the charitable people and the fundraising people can talk to those organizations and see if they're able to help us before christmas so thank you very much for that guys that was very good and almost the better for not being fitted into our october event you got your own airtime there and um it was good stuff. So thank you very much for all of your contributions. It's quite, well, it's extremely thought provoking stuff. So thank you for that. Integrated care system development plan to return to also big ticket items and big future questions. Simon. Thanks, Alan. So um, just in the interest of allowing comment and discussion, I'll keep my remarks relatively um, brief. Um, so, the first thing is the um, policy context, I suppose. You, you've already drawn attention to it, um, but uh, there is now, even since this paper was written, um, NHS England have published um, their thinking on the future of integration. Um, uh, it's beyond the scope of this discussion to, to get into that in, in full detail. Um, Suffice it to say, um, it's a really challenging and interesting set of questions that we've now got to debate locally. Um, and I suppose I'd summarise them in two areas. Um, the first is, um, 
what do we want the ICS to be for? Um, so an integrated commissioning system is just a set of words unless we actually make it mean something. And my question is, what do we want it to mean? What do we want it to mean as a hospital? What do we want it to mean as a group? Um, and there are probably uh, three questions that we've been thinking about as, an, uh, uh, as a healthcare partnership so far. First is, um, how do we start well? Um, so um, there's been a lot uh, of debate recently in, uh, in the literature about um, ensuring that children have the best start in life. Uh, and um, what does that look like for us locally? Uh, then how do we live well? Um, making sure that people um, stay as healthy as they can for as long as they can. And then how do we end well? We need, we've been talking about those aspirations for a number of years in Northamptonshire, and we really need to put flesh on the bones of what we mean by that. Now we've started to do that, particularly in the last um, bucket that I just talked about there with the ICAM programme. The ICAM programme is really sort of trying to focus on the fact that even at the end of our days doesn't mean that they have to be terrible. We should be able to treat people with dignity, respect, honour, uh, respecting their experience just as much as earlier in their life. And if I can is about anything for me, it's about those kind of values, those, those kind of beliefs. Um, and it's remarkable I can because it's the first time that um, uh, it's brought all of the boards together um, in a kind of public orientation around partnership. Still lots to do. And that's an example of what I mean when I say, what do we want the ICS to be? Um, the second set of questions, which is the kind of NHS England set of questions, is really about, um, OK, so how do we structure, if we can come up with what we want to try and deliver, how do we structure that in a way that... Um, works for people and particularly works for people in their place as opposed to some abstract notion of, of, of planning and particularly here I think we should be thinking about the integrated care partnership so we're sitting in North Northamptonshire today or a virtual version thereof um, how are we going to start working with our local uh, our PCNs our our new unitary authority in North Northamptonshire. What does that look like? And how does that help us deliver some of those aspirations um, that I've just been talking about? Um, big questions and ones that we really do need to start grappling with because the journey towards 2022 is, is not really that far away. Um, and then finally, um, just to kind of introduce the discussion, I suppose, um, You'll see in the paper there's a timeline, um, and that timeline is starting to march quite relentlessly towards a, a submission, a direction of travel in December. So Alan and I will be attending a visioning workshop about, so what are the answers to some of the questions that um, I've just raised so that we can inform a submission to NHS England about how we're going to address some of those uh, really important questions. And... I suppose at the back of them, um, it's a kind of variant on the question that Alan often asks, what would it be worth for us if X? Um, and uh, uh, so it's another opportunity for us to approach um, that question as we really think about that visioning workshop. And it will, and it should mean that in the future, we will be prepared to invest very differently than we do now to seek different health outcomes. Um, I've given the example before, but in another system down um, in another part of the country in England, um, they collectively, hospital, local authority, CCG, have chosen to invest in smoking cessation because they judge that in the longer term, that is going to be the biggest benefit to them in terms of hospital admissions and the associated costs to health and well-being. That's the type of question that we are now invited to. Um, to uh, consider. So the paper is here for your um, support. It's going to every single board in Northamptonshire. And really what I would invite is any comments in respect of informing the debate that we're going to have in terms of the visioning workshop and um, your endorsement of the direction of travel that we are engaged on. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Simon. Um, you will note in the um, Chris Palo paper, which is part of the pack for this, Chris is asking for some board members to work with KPMG to work out our engagement and what we want to answer some of these questions as we go forward. And um, I've already asked uh, Lisa and Lisa, Lisa Janoff and Lisa Llewellyn to do that. I think the invitation is already extended to Alice and Rachel and the other nominee from Northampton is Denise. And it's suddenly dawned on me as I go through those names that Chris will be the token man amongst the sisterhood. And uh, I might have to join him to make him feel comfortable, but that aside. Um, uh, so I'd be, I'm grateful for you all agreeing to do that work. Um, other than that, we're now uh, open for questions and comments and discussion about how this will emerge and any thoughts you have on us. I'm all, I, I like the story about the cigarettes, about the smoking. I, I once failed to get a job many, many years ago because I was asked by the very large health board concerned what I thought their big strategic question was. And I said it was childhood self-esteem. Um, and they looked at me with complete incredulity because they thought it was building a new hospital in the other side of the city. So we didn't really agree about what the job was anyway, so I was quite glad I didn't get it. But I think it is important that organisations, when you're actually thinking about these things, about what are the really big questions we want to answer in this. So, thoughts and comments. Lisa, I'm not surprised with your background, you wish to give us a, a view about this. So, well, Lisa and then Trevor. A flippant comment. I think you're just making it difficult with two Lisas and we're going to have that Great fun on that committee. Um, my, my serious point is, um, Andy, I think this is a real challenge and opportunity for information and linking up records and digital, because I think what the ICS is about is not about organisational form, it's about looking at the population as a whole and really understanding who uses what, how outcomes differ. And we only get to that granularity if we really have joined up information and, and are willing and able to interrogate the data to, to gain insights that we might not have ever thought about. I completely agree with that, Lisa. And in fact, our chair to do her justice, um, our new chair, I should have said this, but I'll say it now, said before she gets into the visioning workshop, she wants us to produce a data pack that shows us, um, so what is the real state of health of the people of Northamptonshire? What um, does the data tell us our priorities should be? And let's have an honest look at that across the piece rather than a kind of partial institutional um, uh, focus on it. So uh, you'll be pleased to know that your, um, your challenge finds a, a ready answer in her and I look forward to that debate. I agree with that, Simon, and I have argued for a while we need something akin to an econometric model about where you put money and what return you get for it and what works. And I appreciate that is an extremely difficult thing to construct. But pre-COVID, there was conversations with the public health people in the county and the CCG about developing such, a, such an entity. I'm not sure we put nearly enough money and effort into thinking it through, but nevertheless, the basic idea is crucially important. And I agree with you, Lisa, that this is about um, uh, looking at um, in, in, you know interventions at, at, at patient group level, Trevor and then Chris. Uh, well, two points. One is Lisa said the word population, and I think what we've got to be clear about this is that we're working with we're looking at people, we're looking at population, and not just patients. Yeah. Um, and particularly when we start talking about children, but thinking about children, where do we draw the boundaries? At the moment, we've got largely health we've got local some local authority involvement in this but actually how far do, does the net have to be cast to make it effective and just thinking about the children aspect you know how much should there be involvement for schools uh, and other organizations there it was interesting going back a couple of years ago um when i sort of came back into northamptonshire sort of working with the trust um, at the Health and Wellbeing Board, one of the voices that was listened to most acutely was the police. And they had many things to say that were extremely pertinent to conversations around health and wellbeing. And I just, I'm concerned to make sure that whatever model we develop, uh, we have those channels open 
for whatever organisations need to be involved to maximise the benefit. You're right, Trevor. So I'll offer a couple of observations, if I might. The first is um, population. You're completely correct, but it's population in place. So increasingly, um, and that was why I was making the comments I did about um, what do we think an integrated care partnership looks like? If an integrated commissioning system um, uh, is thinking at the Northamptonshire level, what do we think the more local geography needs to look like? Because we already know, without even scrutinising the data, that the health needs of the people of North Northamptonshire differ to the west of the patch, and we need to start we need to start functioning at a much more local level than we have done now. And to your second point, that involves hearing the voices of our local stakeholders. So precisely, what do the police think? One of the more um, uh, uh, fundamental questions that we will face in the visioning workshop is, is this a health and care enterprise or a health and care enterprise as two separate entities trying to deliver something? Because probably one of the critical design points that we will face is to what extent, going off Lisa's point, do we start collapsing the boundaries between health and care organisations in a far more radical way than we have done up until now? No, there's no answer to that, but it is a, it is a fundamental design challenge that we face. Chris? Uh, thank you, Alan. The only comment I was going to make from my experience elsewhere with an ICS was let's not just focus on physical health the mental health situation is really really important particularly into the future yes yeah. and one of the things that um i think chris colleagues um we as colleagues were debating as we thought about um our responsibilities as we thought of the aftermath of COVID was how did we bring to bear thinking about um, our role in supporting, um, for example, the rebuilding of the local economy. We are an anchor institution in Northamptonshire, the largest single employer probably across Northamptonshire. And we know that the uh, consequences of employment for people's mental health or the lack of employment for people's mental health are huge and significant. And so we need to take a very broad look at what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and mental health needs to be in that for all of us um, as anchor institutions in North Northamptonshire. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Alan. I was really uh, responding uh, to Lee's. Uh, so the Northamptonshire shared care record is really quite mature at the moment, and we intending going on our public awareness campaign and launching it uh, next Monday, in fact. Um, having looked at some of the functionality of this and the business intelligence module that we're going to get to overlay that, the uh, ability to look at population health uh, to get right down to granular detail is truly extraordinary in terms of the flexibility it gives you. So that sort of desire that you're expressing there, I think the need will be met fairly soon. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I don't know what we've got planned for. We have a joint development session in December with the NGH uh, board. I don't know what, quite where the agenda is on that. Obviously, I had some thoughts about it, and so on, but I don't quite know where we are. Is there space for... Um, a little demonstration of the shared care record, Andy. Yeah, we can certainly do that. I'm Thank sure you. we can find some time, Alan. Yeah, and particularly but. sort of understanding the kind of granularity that we can get around the public health issues and so on. And the way I, that I agree. I think the analytics that Andrew's talked about are really impressive. So, uh, yeah, it'd be great to give an opportunity to share that with the board. OK, let's see if we can find a slot for that in the joint joint development session. Joel, focus. Joel. Sorry, just unmuting. Uh, just a comment, really, just um, for those that weren't at the presentation of the ICANN programme last week, we've obviously tried to roadmap our vision into the creation of the ICS. 
So I'm hoping that you can use that um, when you go to your visioning workshop. Um, and it's really great to see the ICAM program embedded into the, the draft strategy that I can see, given that ICAM was only born about four months ago. So I'm, I'm really pleased with that and the impact it will have. And it's going to focus on the whole health population as well. So just that's all I wanted to say. Okay, I think we're kind of there. I think that's an old hand, Chris, if you could lower it, that'd be helpful. Um, and uh, I think we're done there. I do need your formal approval to the, um, I, the the fifth recommendation, which is to give me delegated authority as a trust chair to sign the ICS designation support letter. Nods will suffice. That's good. Thank you very much. And I think we are done on that. Thank you, Simon. I think that's useful. And I think the the, the, the subgroup that Chris is talking about will, when they when they bring back their thoughts, will um, will uh, be quite influential in thinking how we take this forward as a as a group, and and it also is another another opportunity for our non-exec colleagues to begin to get to know each other rather better and build the necessary relationships there. So I think that's good stuff. Okay, well, pretty much bang on time. Um, development control plan and next steps for the hospital redevelopment program. Um, this has obviously been a massive piece of work within the trust and indeed on occasions within the system, within our group, um, because uh, we've obviously had to think about issues around Northampton Hospital and we've had to talk to our partners about the type of hospital we're, we're talking about building. This has gone through lots of bits of process within the organisation and um, Polly is going to as the responsible director for all of this, <laughs> and who has lived and breathed it for quite a long time now. Um, Polly, if you'd like to take us through where we are with this now, because this is the first time we've brought this in, been able to bring this into the public domain. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Chair. Can I just confirm that people can see that presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so I shall take you through some of the slides in the process that we've been following over the last few months. Um, so as uh, all board will know, um, back back 12 months ago now, a long time ago, um, we were announced, delighted to be announced as one of the 40 new hospital uh, projects. Um, and the Prime Minister reconfirmed in October this year that we would definitely be getting some money. So we were given uh, 3.7 million last year to spend this year on um, developing a strategic outline case to explore the different options for how we might redevelop Kettering General Hospital. And I'm pleased to say that we are on track to submit that strategic outline case by the end of this financial year. I think it will be coming back to uh, public board in February or March next year. Once we've completed and submitted that, just as a reminder, we will then be completing an outline business case. It's the process that um, all public sector has to follow. Um, and at the outline business case, we'll do much more detailed look at which services, which clinical services are going where, um, what the internal room designs are, exact locations for staff and patient facilities and that kind of thing. So that's, that's all to follow, all of that exciting work next year. But at the moment, the key thing of the strategic outline case, as I say, is to explore options for how we might redevelop Kettering Hospital. Um, so getting a long list together as to what that might look like, reviewing that against a series of criteria, um, developing a short list as a result of that and a preferred option. That short list will get retested again um, in the next phase of work again. So that's what we've been doing over the last um, year. Um, and I'm here to update on that. But we haven't been doing it on our own. Um, not many of us in the NHS get the opportunity in our careers to undertake large scale developments. Um, so we did a point and we've been working with a series of experts that do this day in, day out, um, not just across the NHS, but internationally as well. So we've been working without, with them throughout the year. That includes um, some architects, uh, engineers, health planners. You can see all, all of the people there. So when this isn't something that we've just come up with ourselves. We have got international experts working with us um, to review our long list and what is reasonable and feasible to develop. 
We've also been engaging extensively with our stakeholders. So we've run a number of events over the last year with our staff. Um, I think in the first one, we had over 500 or 600 comments and ideas from across our staffing base as to the kinds of things that they really want to see included in this redevelopment, what's important for them, what's important for their patients. We've also ran then focused staffing groups um, in urgent care, for example, planned care, children's and across the patch so that we really can have some of those detailed conversations with our clinical staff and managers in those areas as to the important things that we need to be considering. We've also run two different public engagement events and various different engage engagement events with our governors and others um, to again hear from our patients and hear from our public as to the difficulties that they find with the current hospital buildings and the current hospital site and therefore the priorities that we need to be thinking about um, as we move forward with the development. Um, in terms of progress, um, we have been to board a number of times. So this is just up here as a reminder. Um, we, uh, August board in particular, we discussed and agreed the design principles that would be integral into any new buildings. So that was things like, you know, making sure we are pandemic proof, making sure that we are really innovative with the way we use digital uh, technology in the buildings, making sure that we've got enough car parking spaces. So everything from future looking innovation to the really practical things. Um, so we discussed that at August board and we agreed our critical success factors there too. We came back again in September and had a look at our long list um, of options of, as to how we could redevelop the hospital. Um, and then in October, on the 16th of October, we had an appraisal panel of that long list. And I'll go through some of the detail of that in a moment. Um, and that comprised of all of us as board directors and non-exec directors and our lead governor, um, was part of that as well. As I say, I'll take you through the details of that. And really what we're here to do now is to, I'll present back the output of that appraisal panel and what our subsequent uh, private board session then agreed to be our shortlist and our preferred option. So before I do that, let me take you through some of the detail around the redevelopment of the hospital. Um, so this is our development control plan, we call it. It's our long term development for the hospital site. Um, and I'll take you through the detail of some of that. That's an artist's impression of what it look, could look like. And the development control plan itself, just in general, um, what we do is we start at the moment, our hospital site has 80% of our buildings are deemed as unfit for current uh, medical care. Um, we provide safe care in those buildings, but it is certainly not um, ideal for our staff or our patients to be treated in those. So what we will do as part of this redevelopment that I'll take you through is build some buildings, some big new buildings in the centre of the site that enable a lot more clinical adjacencies to happen, a lot greater efficiencies as to how we can treat our patients. That again is better for patients because it means you're getting the right care faster because our staff are co-located, which means you're getting treatment faster and then getting uh, discharged and able to go home faster. So I won't go through all of those, but certainly one of the key things we're trying to do again is make the site a um, really positive place to be when you're undergoing hospital treatment. So to have much more natural light, some green space and health and well-being, both for our staff and for our patients. So this is um, a view of our current hospital site. At the top uh, right hand side here um, would be the A14. And you can see the Rothwell Road here running down the right hand side of the diagram running down the hill. And you can see there um, how spread out a lot of our buildings are. And that's because much like the rest of the NHS, you get a little bit piece of capital as the years go on and you can do um, a little building and then you do another new building, another new building, um, and you start to run out of space, which is the pro problem that we've got on the current hospital site. We had, do have two fairly new buildings on the site, which I will come on to, but the vast majority, as I say, 80% of our buildings um, are in condition C and condition D. Um, and it's that that we need to prioritize removing from clinical care. In the future, this is our, the output of our development control plan. This is what the hospital will look like again. Um, Rothwell Road here running down the right hand side and you can see that some of our oldest buildings on the site which are the 100 year old plus buildings that currently sit on the Rothwell Road. We're looking to um, remove those and open up 
this big area and you can see the purple area there is a new drop-off facility um, for staff and for patients so patients can get dropped off really close to our buildings um, and we can cut down on the long travel times we currently have from where our car parks are to where patients will be able to get care. And I'll take you through the stages of development that we'll need to go through and there are five stages to that development. This is the artist's impression. Um, so this drawing down at the bottom here, this um, is again looking at the hospital from the Rothwell Road. And you can see here the big green space and the drop off areas um, for, for patients that we'll have. Phase one is our urgent care hub. And the second diagram up here shows you in a bit more detail what that urgent care hub is going to be looking like. That's our first building we'll be doing on the site. So um, this is our this is um, the hospital site. Just it's slightly different orientation in that you've got the Rothwell Road at the top there of the site, and these two buildings shown here in dark grey are our newest buildings on the site, 10 years old or less. Um, the first one is the foundation wing, um, where our current, we've got state-of-the-art ITU in there, um, our children's ward Skylark is in there, and um, some of our cardiology facilities. And we've got our treatment centre. So the view is that we will keep those. We don't need to knock those down. We'll keep them on the site and we will start to build around those. So all of these areas in shaded dark and shaded grey there are our current hospital buildings. So this is phase one. Um, and as I say, phase one is going to be our new urgent care hub facility. We've already been awarded £46 million towards that build. Um, and that will now be a six storey building. So we will have A&E on the ground floor um, and some short stay facilities above that in assessment areas. And we'll then have six new wards above um, that, that building. So we'll then go for a six storey building, as I say, and really in terms of the efficiencies I was talking about, all of our urgent care will then be co-located in one building. It enables all of our staff to be working in that building, really fast access to that specialist opinions um, for our patients um, and patients will move up into there. That's going to cost £250 million um, and you will see that we get then some new blue light ambulance roads into that building um, and down at the bottom of the site there we will be building a new urgent care um, a new energy center sorry um, which will enable us to um, upgrade all the infrastructure that we have across the site for our energy and lead us to becoming much more of a, sus a sustainable and net carbon zero trust in the future and you can see here some some different routes in for the site that we've got there once we've built that urgent care hub, we will then be able to decant services from our current A&E department. And that's that building 16 that you see there. That's our current A&E. And so our clinical services will move out of there and into our new urgent care hub, which will enable us to then start to demolish those buildings to allow us to have enough space to build phase two. And this is phase two. So again, another six storey building. We're moving down the hospital site though, down the hill. Um, so it doesn't look as big, but it's still six storey. Um, and in there, we're, what, we're, what we'll be doing is replacing our theatres, um, our endoscopy, pathology, and basically 70% of our adult inpatient beds then start to get replaced in that phase two. So the, a lot of our patients will then start to see improvements when they come into the hospital, even if they're not coming in for emergency care. And again, same principle applies that once we have start to uh, move services into here, we'll be able to demolish some of those other buildings in the middle of the site. And then that allows us enough space to do phase three. Now, currently, um, this phase two is going to be costing 361 million. You've got a cost here of 532, and that's because that includes our VAT and inflation. And I'll come on to that in a little while. So phase three, again, this just enables us to almost completely now um, replenish nearly all of our hospital inpatient beds. So that means no matter what service you're coming into the hospital for, and a lot of our elderly care wards will all now have access to brand new hospital facilities. It starts to enable us to open up some green space on the site um, and really, really starts to make some big improvements as we, as we go through. And again, another six storey building that you can see at the bottom there. Phase four um, is um, further building. So we're replacing the, gen the big uh, ward block here. And, and you can see there that we move on to phase five. And really by the end, 
by the time we get to this, this is where we start to develop a real health and social care integrated campus for the hospital. Um, it will be already started talking to our partners in other health and care settings to say, what, what do we need on the Kettering Hospital site um, that isn't just acute care? Well, we were mentioning earlier about mental health and other things that actually we could now use the site to develop an integrated campus in line with our ICS approach that we were just talking about. Um, so that's really the development control plan. Um, and so what we did is, and I'll go through this, we held the appraisal panel on the 16th of October, where we looked at all of those options. And we, the process that you follow is really quite robust. Um, we don't get a choice about it as the HM Treasury guidance that's up there. Um, but what you need, what we do, and I'll take you through this, is we score each of those options um, against critical success factors that we agreed previously at board. So these are the five domains that you have to go through. Um, and if you look at it as a column rather than a row, um, so one by one, the appraisal panel went through these options and said, do they pass or fail the critical success factors? And we went through one by one of these. The key one, of course, and um, the one most people would be interested in is about the service solution. So the phases that I just took you through, um, there were five phases I just took you through. Um, the sixth phase, the sixth option that we looked at was a full rebuild on a greenfield site elsewhere. So not staying on the current hospital site. And we looked at those individually one by one and rated them against our critical success factors. And this is one of the key things that we used to be able to do that. So you can see here each of the phases of the options across here, um, which is the naught to five on the current hospital site, six being the greenfield site. And really, we assessed these for what they really delivered for our patients, what the improvements each of those um, can deliver to our patients and our local residents um, is the first key thing we looked at. And then the second key thing is, and how affordable then is that to the NHS and to the hospital and the taxpayer? And what's the value for money we can get out of that? So let me take you through some of these going across. Um, so overall impact on the estate. I told you a little while ago that currently 80% of our estate is in condition C and D, so un unfit really for, for purpose. And you can see there, so 20% currently is in A and B. And you can see as you move through, so once we've built the urgent care hub um, and the wards on top for phase one, we then get 43% of our estate is in a good condition. By the time we've built phase two, we've jumped up to 76% of our estates in good condition. And by the time we get to phase three, 83%. And you can see there by phase four, 91%, and by phase five, 100%. And of course, on a greenfield site, because it's a single new build, um, then we, all, we immediately get 100% in good condition. So that's really important because, of course, it shows um, what, what proportion of our patients are going to get treated um, in the new hospital estate. I've been through some of the patient benefits that we talked about and the kinds of services um, that our patients will be getting in terms of new build. And then we looked at the capital affordability. So it's worth noting, and I put it in my paper that accompanied this, um, that provisionally we have been allocated 350 million through from the um, the HIP program. We've already got 46 million for our urgent care hub on top of that. So that's 396 million that we've provisionally got. Now, um, when you look at the capital amounts, so phase two is actually 300, and it doesn't sound on here, it's actually 361 million ex exclusive of VAT and inflation. So that falls within the capital allocation that we've already got. Um, once you add VAT and inflation, that comes up to 532. Phase three um, is 518 without VAT and inflation. Um, and as I say, likewise, when you add that on, you get up to the 765. So you can see the capital amounts as you go across here. Um, it's worth pointing out by the time we get to well, our sixth option, the Greenfield site is 1.3 billion. Apologies, it says. Um, the reason why that's so much money, so or so much more than a, a option five whole site development on the current hospital site, 
It's two reasons, really. First of all, the buildings that I showed you at the beginning, the treatment centre and the foundation wing, we obviously wouldn't be able to keep if we were going to move to a, a new hospital site. So it means we'd need to rebuild the entirety of the hospital rather than being able to keep some of our facilities. Also, the Greenfield site um, that was identified as being potentially available, um, we would have to install all the infrastructure, the water, the gas, the electricity, all the things that we currently already have on this site, we would need to replace. And that's why that cost that extra little bit more money there. I think the other key thing that we talked about at the appraisal panel and challenged ourselves on quite a lot was on the estimated revenue impact and that's the second to bottom line here. Um, and just to be clear on that, so capital um, unfortunately in the NHS isn't free. Um, so whilst we will get given um, a portion of capital, we will have to pay charges annually um, back to the government and HM Treasury on that capital amount. And that those charges are based, based on a percentage of the capital that we have, which is why you can see them increasing as the capital amounts increase. And this is really key because um, we need to be sure that we can commit to paying back that amount of money. And you can see here, it starts off at phase two, we will have to pay back 26 million nearly every single year. 37 and a half in phase three, and it starts to increase up to 43 and a half and 50, 52 um, by phase five. So those are some significant amounts of money that as a board and the appraisal panel really had to consider. So let me take you on to then the output of the appraisal panel. So you can see here down the left hand side was the long list of options we looked at and the appraisal panel um, started having a look at business as usual first of all we were all very clear um, early on that we cannot carry on as we are and that's why you can see that it failed that option failed our critical success factors it failed on nearly all of them um, because we just we just can't carry on as we are we then looked at the other end of the site and we looked at uh, the greenfield site and really we um, had to discount the greenfield site as a viable option um, really just based on what I just said, mainly the affordability. So just to flick back and remind you, we could not sign up the organisation to pay back £64 million every single year. We would end up with a, a lovely, beautiful hospital building, um, but we wouldn't have enough staff to be able to staff it and we wouldn't have enough services to be able to run in it because we just wouldn't be able to afford it. So that's why we discounted that. Um, plus the time scale to build a new hospital on a greenfield site is a lot further in the future than if we were to start building on the current hospital site. And that was really key for us because our patients do have to, at the moment, are using buildings that really aren't fit for purpose. And we, as an appraisal panel, didn't feel it was right to uh, keep our patients having to use those buildings um, for longer than we absolutely had to. So that led us to staying on the current hospital site and we assessed those options in more detail. Again, option uh, five, um, phase five that we talked about. At the current time, we have also discounted based on affordability and based on the length of time it would take to build. Just to be clear, that is not to say that we don't want to get to phase five of a new build um, in the future. We absolutely do. We want to see the whole of our development control plan delivered. But at this stage um, and in this capital funding round, um, we discounted that. So the appraisal panel then um, looked in some detail at one to four. And you can see here um, that really um, we our preferred option was option phase three. The reason why that was our preferred option um, is that really by that point in time, the vast majority of our patients, as I said, 83% of our buildings will be in condition A and B. That means the vast majority of, of our patients will be able to get the care they need in fit for purpose buildings. And that's really important to us. It will look and it will feel like a new hospital and our patients would be able to access care in those new facilities. Anything before that, if we just stopped at phase one, which is the urgent care hub, there's only a, a small proportion of our patients who will be able to access those new buildings and get care in that in that new environment. And as an appraisal panel and then at our private board, we felt we owed it to our patients um, to really start pushing that capital amount and get as much new build as we possibly could. So this summarises um, the output. As I say, we're 
what we're looking for now is this is our shortlist. Phase one to phase four is our shortlist that we're taking forward for more testing as part of the strategic outline case. They will get retested again in the outline business case. But at the moment, our preferred option is certainly um, option three. Which, are, which is our 518 million pound option plus VAT and plus inflation. So I think um, to conclude really on the appraisal process itself, Chair, we think we were happy. We now have a really robust long-term development plan for the site. We're really proud of it. We think it's gonna make a huge difference to our local population and to our patients. So we're really pleased that that's deliverable and we've and we've got that and we are of course delighted to have received the funding uh, that we've already been uh, told that we've got i.e the 46 million for the urgent care hub and the 350 million um, so really pleased about that but if we stop there we know that some of our uh, particularly our elderly care wards and our elderly patients will continue to have to use some of our older facilities so we don't want to stop there and we want to go on to option three um, and start to bid for that level of funding because that's where the vast majority of our patients will really start to see the benefits of, of having a new hospital. And really, I suppose that concludes um, my update on the appraisal panel and the decision that board took for, um, for the strategic outline case to then be submitted towards the end of the financial year. I did include in my paper, um, so some next steps. Um, and in terms of what the programme will be working on over the next few months um, and also our phase one. So it's it's key now for us that we move ahead with phase one of our plans for the redevelopment. So I just showed you that's the urgent care hub and the six wards above. Um, and we had had a conversation. We had a conversation with um, our regional regulators last week and they've confirmed that they're happy for us to move now to full business case um, for that scheme. So we'll be looking to do that um, at the start of of 2021 um, and it is clear now as I say that it's going to be much more efficient operationally it's going to be much better for our patients clinically and it's going to be much better value for money for the taxpayer if we move ahead with the whole six-story building rather than the original plan, which was just for the £46 million urgent care hub um, that we'd been given approval for. So as I said, you can see there why it's just going to be so much better for our patients to get faster access to diagnosis and treatment, much better for our clinical staff to all be working in one facility and have the clinical adjacencies that we need, and much better value for money that, that we build it all at once. So just to note that we will be moving ahead with that um, in the start of the next year. And I will stop speaking there i don't know whether okay polly thank you that's uh, a very clear exposition of a very complicated problem and a lot of work that sat behind it um and i hope it explains the uh, difficult starting with is it possible to rebuild uh, a hospital on the kettering site followed by and what is the best solution to how to do that that is both affordable in capital and revenue terms. I'm going to turn to the two non-exec directors most involved with this on the Strategic Development Committee. So that'll be Lisa and Trevor. So Lisa, would you like to give us your comments and then I'll open it up for any uh, anybody else who wants to contribute. Lisa. Yeah, yes, certainly. Um, I'm going to start by saying thanks to Polly and the team because this uh, agenda is both challenging and fluid and sometimes the uh, political kind of uncertainties behind it causes some issues and apologies it's my dog who's decided that actually at this moment in time he's going to bark <laughs> so for me there's several steps of assurance as a non-exec i get in this which is uh the slide says that we've been involved since August. I think that underplays it. As a board, we've been having discussions around the urgent care hub as it started uh, for over a year. And certainly as an SDC, we have been having very detailed conversations around each stage, challenging and going back and reviewing when decisions were made and making sure that there was clarity. Um, I think we've got a good set of external advisors. As a board, we said, challenge us, make sure that we're getting, you know, a, a, a stretching view of the future rather than actually staying comfortable. Uh, and the, the working relationship with those, uh, the external planners uh, and support on the SDC is really good. 
And I think actually what Polly and Simon have done throughout the programme is also look at engaging with our community through this. So it's not just a hospital view of the world. We've actually gone out engaging with the governors, etc. cetera. So um, I feel very confident that actually the solutions that we've got to date and presented in front of us are the best options for our community. Uh, and as I said, thanks to Polly and the team, it's, uh, it's very well organized. Thank you very much. Trevor and then Simon. Um, thank you, Polly, and thank you to the team. Um, I'm reflecting here on another hospital development that I was involved in a few years ago, which took eight years um, from the uh, start to the full business case approval, let alone the build. Uh, and I think that what's been done in the time scale uh, and the depth of what's been done in the time scale is so important. So in terms of and uh, Lisa's mentioned it, in terms of the amount of engagement that has been going on, it's been substantial. I was particularly reflective of the discussions we had at the August Strategic Development Committee about the number of beds we needed, you know, and the codependencies, and we've mentioned ICANN earlier on, the codependencies on actually the system-wide work that is going on, so that we're not actually designing a bed, a uh, hospital, with the bed base of over a thousand beds that we will need for the size of the population, because actually that won't be the model of care that they, the patients need. So it's that sort of detailed work that goes before a single sort of line in terms of drawing a hospital um, has been undertaken. It's actually saying, what is it we need? What are the codependencies we need? Etc. So I've been very impressed both with the uh, speed and having the background of um, somebody around the table that's got this international view because there has been a dearth of build in the UK for a number of years around hospitals. So picking up what's best around the globe has been important in terms of what it is we're trying to achieve here. Um, yes. We're, we're putting together and proposing an option that doesn't completely rebuild the site, but we've been pragmatic about what it is we can afford. Uh, we're trying to push the boundary of that clearly, but um, I think that where we got to with the going through the options, that was the best um, solution that we could have done at that point in time. Okay, Trevor, thank you. Both of those are both reassuring, assuring and reassuring and helpful. Mm -hmm. Simon. Thanks, Alan. Um, firstly, just to add uh, my own uh, personal congratulations to Polly. She's done uh, with her team an outstanding job to get us to where we are, and it would be remiss not to note that first of all. Um, I would also um, publicly, before I say what I intend to, like to thank our local MPs in North Northamptonshire, all of whom have been assiduous in their support and continue to be so of what we propose. And um, I have taken them through the thinking as to where we have got to. And they, like we, are excited about the development control plan that is in front of us. It's also really fantastic that we finally got permission to now proceed. It's another significant hurdle, another significant milestone that we can begin development of our FBC, our full business case, because it brings the, the day one a little nearer when we're actually going to be putting spades um, in the ground to start a, uh, a rebuilding our hospital. Um, however, um, it's, a, it's important that we know, and it's important that we are clear with our public that um, although we are rebuilding uh, an important building for this hospital, um, its emergency department, and we hope to rebuild some of the associated wards as an integrated facility, that does not represent a new hospital. Um, and it's important just to be candid and direct about that because the vast majority of our buildings and the vast majority of the inpatient experience 
um, would remain the same for people who come to our hospital and use it. The diagrams, I think, make that abundantly clear. And so although we should rightfully pause and reflect and be proud of what we've achieved, we need to redouble our efforts to make sure that we continue to secure the funding that we need in order to rebuild um, a hospital fit for the next generation, because it is, as I think Alan said, a generational building that we're um, proceeding with here, developing. And it's right, you know, that the people of Kettering and North, Northamptonshire shouldn't be the forgotten people. Um, they deserve a new hospital, just as much as many of our neighbours around us have had investment to rebuild their hospitals. Um, so do they deserve that investment. And it is important that we say today that although we've taken a significant step in the right direction, we are not there yet and we need to redouble our efforts to secure that funding. Thank you, Simon. So I'm assured, as I hope everybody else is, that the processes have been very good. Um, I'm going to turn to our lead governor now because Peter's been heavily involved in this, both in the consultation side of it and as a as the governor involved in the SD in the Strategic Development Committee. So, Peter, thank you, Aaron. Um, can you just tell me if you can hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're fine. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, thanks for that. Um, yes, I was the governor on the the committee, and uh, having had a little bit of experience, I have to say that I endorse everything that's been said at the moment by. Uh, uh, those speakers before me. Um, I think, speaking from a governor's point of view, we're all behind what Simon has just said about trying to push the envelope a bit harder, because at the end of the day, um, we represent our members, we represent the public, and we want to see uh, the hospital developed to its first extremes as possible. And uh, I think you know from conversations that we've had previously that the governors are behind doing that with you and we will make every effort that we can to, to uh, make that work with the trust. Um, I think at the end of the day, hospital construction is always a, a difficult thing to get your head around, particularly if it's in a phased approach. And I think I would suggest that people um, recognize that it's gonna be a phased approach and um, treat it as such because it's not going to be built uh, in, a, in a couple of years, it's going to take quite a few years to get this final hospital up and running. And um, I hope, to be honest, I hope I'm around to see it. And I'm sure there's lots of people around this table who would feel the same. So um, thank you very much. And as I say, from a governor's perspective, we want to support the trust going forward on this in the best way that we can. Thank you very much, Peter. We'll uh, do our best to keep you ticking over um, for the next decade or thereabouts, which is roughly what we're talking about. Hey guys, I, I, I open it up for any other comments, although I think the key comments have been made. Um, and we are simply meeting in, this is a public meeting where we endorse the process we've gone through up to now, the decisions we've made about the um, schemes that we are supporting and the preferred option that we are running with. Does anybody else want to say anything on this one? No, I think we might assume that we have universal support. We're very grateful for the governor's support, Peter, and I'm sure they will be pivotal in talking to our community and the people they represent, and I, I guess the media uh, on behalf of the patients they, they represent to main, maintain the arguments uh, along with the help of our local MPs and uh, I would expect councillors as well because we have broad support for this across the piece. So thank you very much everybody for that. Academic strategy, Andrew. Um, thank you so much, Alan. Um, I'm also very pleased to see that uh, both Kevin Harris and Professor Philip Baker have joined us. Uh, Professor Philip Baker is the Pro Vice Chancellor and Head of College uh, of Life Sciences and Dean of Medicine at the University of Leicester. And Professor Kevin Harris is the Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs. So welcome, and it's lovely to have you here. We've had a lot of really good news today and, 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 and sort of uplifting stories. Uh, this is a very fun that is coming your way now. Um, 
At our last board, I provided an update on the academic strategy, uh, and today's purpose is to seek a board approval for the strategy. And this is exciting, it's a great opportunity, and it's part of our pathway to excellence. The academic uh, strategy's vision is improving care through excellence in education and research. We know research informs practice, and clinical trials provide opportunity for patients to be exposed to uh, enhanced therapeutic opportunity. And the strategy aligns with the current board strategic objectives, but also with the vision, mission, and values work that's been the focus of the group. At the heart of the strategy, it seeks to bring about investment in academic posts uh, in partnership with the University of Leicester, investment in infrastructure and estate, and some of this has been accounted for uh, in, in the development control plan, and university hospital accreditation. So that's the direction of travel. And in order to deliver the strategy, we've developed eight key objectives uh, as outlined in the strategy. The benefits of a successful academic strategy uh, are better outcomes for patients, a better teaching offer, an expanded teaching officer, uh, offer, workforce security uh, and stability, and being a, a magnet for sort of talent attraction and not forgetting multi-professionalism. Some of the success measures around this will be university hospital accreditation, and that's part of our first milestone, an increased uh, NIHR and other grant bodies uh, fundings, and an increased uh, patient off uh, offer. And my personal sort of dream in all of this is that every patient who attends our hospital has the opportunity to be enrolled or enlisted, recruited to a clinical trial. And, uh, the academic uh, strategy is the key milestone to supporting the group's mission, vision, and values overall. And I will be in the future bringing a business case uh, to the relevant board committees for approval to support the delivery of the academic strategy. But I want to assure everyone uh, there is a detailed implementation plan being worked up to support the delivery of the academic strategy. And that's my summary of it. Thank you very much, Andrew. Philip, Kevin, do you um, want to say anything at this point? Well, I know that Kevin has to leave at half past one, so it might be appropriate for Kevin to speak first. Kevin? Thank, thanks, so thanks, Chair. No, I mean, from a University of Leicester perspective, we're enormously excited about what we see as taking our relationship with the hospitals of Northamptonshire to, to the next step. I mean, Andrew's already articulated very well what, what benefits this can bring for patients in terms of their improved care, what it can bring to the hospital in terms of staff retention and recruitment, and what benefits uh, it can bring in terms of res research income. I think, I think it is fair to say that we've already, we're have we building on what was already a well-established relationship which Kettering had and Northampton had with our medical school, both as we expand that and as we've developed courses relevant to the training of allied health professionals. And and this, is, this document really articulates what is very much about taking uh, this journey to, to the next level. And, and uh, at the University of Leicester, where we are very excited about this prospect. Thank you. Philip. And I just would, would, whole, would wholly endorse that, uh, just adding that um, the paper was presented at our executive board a week or so ago and uh, was very strongly endorsed. Um, if your boards are supportive of the endeavour, it will need to be ratified by our university council. But I think as a direction of travel, I share Kevin's excitement. I think it would be uh, a mutually beneficial synergy and um, would warmly recommend it. Thank you very much. Simon. Um, thanks, Alan. Just firstly, um, thanks to all um, uh, of the people who've spoken, so Andrew, Kevin and Philip, for their support of this um, and getting the work and doing the work that's enabled us to um, present this to you um, today. Um, for me, um, I strongly welcome, endorse and support the strategy. It's about a long term um, direction of travel that I think we need to set investing in the future. Um, as Kevin said, we are building on a successful series of local partnerships and we believe that with the group we will be able to strengthen 
and deepen those. And so um, I hope today that the board will feel um, able to support it. I believe it will. Um, but I do believe it will be of significant benefit to both our patients. I really liked Andrew's framing of that aspiration. I thought that was great. Um, but also to our staff, you know, we're all sitting around this virtual table because to a certain extent, we've been incredibly fortunate in our careers. And part of our job now is to help create the next generation of talent in both nursing, midwifery, AHPs to kind of work here. And we believe that by making this investment, we will help make that happen. Um, and so I enthusiastically endorse and support this strategy. Okay, thank you, Simon. Anybody else want to comment on it before I um, wrap it up? I mean, it, I suspect the answer is no to that. And I'm listening up shaking heads simply because the argument is so self-evidently robust, really. Um, and um, I mean, I can wax lyrical and have done for 20 odd years since I looked after Cambridgeshire Health Authority and then Trent and then Norfolk stuff in Cambridge about the benefits of clinical academic leadership and the linkage with universities and what it does for the quality of your services and your recruitment and I can wax lyrical as all you guys can about the benefits of research and trials and other things for patient care and, and patient benefit and recruitment and all the rest of it. So I think the argument is well made. We've talked about this a lot through the um, priority setting and the work for the group and through the collaboration program board, which has set out the working priorities for this. And just to make it clear, the objective is to be there by next September. And I think we're all of the view that that is eminently achievable, not just for us then, but it also has benefits for our young people, our students who there are considerable benefits going forward, given the mess up uh, uh, over A-levels and other things this year. I think there's opportunity and you know, there's benefits across the piece. So um, I'm not seeing any hands up. I am seeing a lot of things in the chat about this is what we want to do. This is a great thing. Um, thank you, Philip and Kevin, for your support. I think you can take it and the minutes can take it that we have um, strong and universal support across this board, as we had in Northampton last week for um, the programme uh, outlined here and for the development of a full business case to allow us to endorse it in parallel with the work the university has to do. So thank you very much for your time and uh, thank you very much for your contributions. Thanks, thank you, Chair, thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys, that's good stuff. Um, where am I now? I've got a number of um, constitutional and um, terms of reference things for them. Most of them are for simple approval and information. Richard, is there anything that I need particular approval to in this? Uh, very much the um, constitution, a number of changes have been made. The constitution that governs us as a foundation trust uh, hasn't been uh, systematically reviewed since the foundation trust started in 2008. So a small group of um, governors and uh, Trevor representing non-executives and uh, as audit committee chair met and have made these proposals. Um, if approved today, we will take them to the Council of Governors on Wednesday this week as it requires their assent. The majority of the rest of the papers are there for either information or approval to changes to terms of reference, but just to note the establishment of the group quality and group digital hospital committees as committees in common of this board and the Northampton General Board, which is a major milestone in our development of the governance work that supports our group ambitions and just to note a very minor amendment following the NGH board yesterday on the group quality committee terms of reference um, just to clarify that the meeting frequency is bi-monthly and will not be on the same day as the individual uh, trust quality committees which is in the paper in your pack that has since been amended. Okay, thank you for that. Can we do the constitution first? Is everybody happy to approve that? Trevor? Just very quickly, I think it can't go miss, we can't miss the opportunity. Richard May has done a huge amount of work to get us to this point on the constitution. I just want to say thanks to Richard because actually getting this discussed with the governors as well, it's um, been a Herculean task in a very short uh, time scale. Okay, well done, Richard. You can smile and nod at that. That's good stuff. Right, anybody, anybody have any problem with the amendments to the Constitution being through the process? No? 
Good, thank you very much. Are you happy with the um, committee terms of reference? Audit committee, going, going, gone. Um, the amend the uh, OD committee, change of name, and uh, these are all the bringing together of the work uh, that's been going on. The group quality committee, again, they're all happy. And uh, the group digital hospital committee, which, in, which does have a slightly different approach because Northampton didn't have one. So Alice will be chairing that um, and there will be non-exec representative from Northampton, but in a very supportive and vice chairy sort of role. But certainly for the first, I think we agreed here, Alice, that you would be chairing that joint committee, did we? Or was it six months? Anyway, we agreed for quite a long time anyway. Um, and uh, that's good stuff. Um, and you're all happy with the appointment to board committees. Nobody asked for any changes to that. Good. And... Um, we don't have any questions from the public, so I open up any other business, which I have nothing. Don't see any hands up, don't have anything. Thank you very much. I'd be grateful if you would now um, pass the resolution to exclude the representatives person, members of the public for the remainder of the meeting, having regard to the confidential nature of the business. Again, nodding will suffice. Thank you very much. You're back at two o'clock on a different um, link, which you should have uh, uh, 